The Marvel Universe has been completely restructured to have a different history and a different set of superheroes. This is Heroes Your Board, presented to you by the Comic Story and Channel. This is where we take your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and we break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then I read them dramatically back to you. All alterations to the panel, sex, and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. The Heroes Your Board series is an alternate universe created within Marvel Comics a few months ago. The general idea is, what if Captain America was never thought and therefore the Avengers never created? What kind of superheroes would exist in the Marvel Universe? Well, we got basically Justice League analogs, and what this story is, is telling you all kinds of history in this new universe, from their origins, to different characters, to how well-known Marvel superheroes would be treated in a DC-like universe. I hope you guys enjoy, and I'll see you at the end of the video. In East Los Angeles, Robbie Reyes races down the street on his bike, asking why is he always late for school? Why is he the slowest kid in LA? But while rushing through, a hooded man tries to stop him, telling him, I'm looking for the Ghost Rider. Robbie keeps pedaling. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds like it could kill you if you smoke it. However, as Robbie rides off, the man steps out of the shadows and he explains that we are currently in a world where the Avengers don't exist. And for some reason, he is the only man that knows who they are. For some reason, he is the only man that knows how the world was supposed to be. And this man's name is Blade. Meanwhile, over in Washington, D.C., Dr. Doom lands, calling out the rulers of this land to inform them that this is your notice that you are being invaded by the Latvarian Liberation Army. And by army, I mean Doom! My homeland was taken from me, so now I will take yours, just as I took this crimson gem from its hidden temple, the Temple of Sitorak, God of Rage and Unstoppability, which makes me Dr. Juggernaut. Doom grows to the size of the actual Juggernaut, plowing through the agents that are guarding the White House until he is punched in the head by none other than Hyperion. Doom yells, you dare stop me. You turned my country against me. Now I will reforge your beloved America into my own. Grah! Hyperion begins to rip the Crimson Gem out of Doom's forehead, telling him, If by turn your country against you, you mean the squadron made certain that fair elections finally were held in Latveria, then yes, we most certainly did, Dr. Juggernaut. Doom knocks Hyperion away, telling him, No, your atomic strength will not save you from the wrath of Doom! Not this time! But as Doom grabs a hold of Hyperion, Hyperion begins to flex his super muscles in his neck to break free, blasting Doom with his sunlight beam. Doom screams in pain, yelling, There is no truth here! No justice! Everything that you claim to stand for is nothing but a lie! Hyperion radios out to the Squadron Supreme that his old arch enemy, Dr. Doom, has somehow escaped from the negative zone and is attacking the White House, powered up like never before. Nighthawk tells him that it's not just Doom. He brought the rest of his Masters of Doom. The Capitol Dome isn't usually black or trying to murder him. Suddenly, several armed agents jump out pointing guns. Hail the Black Skull! While Nighthawk fights the symbiote-infused Black Skull, Dr. Spectrum rockets up into space to intercept an unidentified object. He flies by Air Force pilot Carol Danvers, who in this universe is not Captain Marvel. She's had far too many reports of insubordination. Heck, she's not even a captain. She's just a pilot. She's told to pull away and let the heavy hitters handle this one, and she mumbles under her breath, stupid squatties get all the fun. But watching this across the way is Tony Stark, who watches Dr. Spectrum and scoffs that it's America's cosmic super soldier. Gotta say, not a fan. You know why? Because all powerful super stones are bad for business. Now, guided missiles, on the other hand, you see, this world is very different. Tony Stark still makes weapons of war. Captain Marvel is just Carol Danvers. And the spirit of vengeance in Starbrand were deemed too dangerous and banished into the negative zone. The nation of Wakanda doesn't appear on any maps, and it was dismissed as a myth years ago. The power of the Iron Fist never left the mountains of Tibet, and Tony Stark never took a piece of shrapnel to the heart. However, it is possible that all of these things may not have happened 
because of one single change. You see, in this world, Captain America isn't alive. Thus, the Avengers never existed. Instead, there is the Squadron Supreme of America. And without the Avengers, that absence rippled out into all corners of the globe. Without the Avengers, Wanda Maximoff and her troublemaking brother Pietro were never reformed. Pietro was killed when battling the Squadron Supreme, and Wanda used her chaos magic to absorb his powers, turning her into the super speed sorcerer, the Silver Witch. The final Allfather, destroyer of Asgard, the unstoppable Allgog, fights against the power princess, which means the gods are dead. And that thing that Dr. Spectrum saw in space, it was something that Spectrum thought had died. As he's berated with the cosmic gauntlet, the great Thanos laughs while he yields all of the infinity rings. There were so many strange things in this world, but everything seemed like this is how it was supposed to be. And the only person that could tell that something was different is Blade. So he did a little bit of digging and decided to look for a god to join him. While the others got their powers from different means, there's one individual, one person on the Avengers who by birth should have his abilities. So a few days before all of this in a bar in Norway, Blade says that he remembers when he became an Avenger. This is where Thor took him to get a drink. He told him a story of how Thor's father sent him to Earth and made him human to teach him about humility. Then he found a hammer and he became godly. The only problem is in this whacked out world, you never found the hammer, did you, Thor? Thor grips his drinking horn. My father is dead and I know nothing of hammers or this Avenger person that you seek. Leave me be, annoying person. For I must have words with my only friend here. As thunder can be heard outside, Blade leans in asking if he can hear that. He is the one that is making that happen, so stop drinking into oblivion and start remembering who you are. Thor shouts, I said leave me be, or by the bones of my father I shall... Thor begins to vomit as Blade sighs. Why the hell am I the only person that seems to remember how the world is supposed to be? In the middle of all of this though, we have a new president of the United States, President Phil Coulson. But while Coulson and his Squadron Supreme of America battle against the Masters of Doom, Blade continues with his investigation. He continues to look for a way to correct all of this. And it took him a little while to find it, but thankfully he can smell human blood. No matter how faint, no matter how cold. You see, in 1945, the greatest hero of the world disappeared. He was lost and presumed dead, even though he was in fact not. There just weren't any Avengers to go and find him. Which, strangely enough, while Blade finds the frozen Captain America, the drunkard Thor somehow accidentally summons Mjolnir. Years ago, the mighty Galactus came to Earth so that he could drain it of all of its elemental life. However, even the all-powerful Galactus could not stand up to the one who protected America. Home of the land of hard-fought liberty. A man of sun-forged honesty, atomic grit, and red-blooded American way. Hyperion. Since crashing to the Earth in a small spaceship and being raised by one of their own, Mark Milton has lived among the humans as a schoolteacher, instilling the values that he learned while growing up. And when S.H.I.E.L.D. scientist Dr. Reed Richards calls upon the hero Hyperion is quick to answer the call. Reed tells him that since placing Dr. Doom in the negative zone, they had a negative zone breakout, which is what he feared since they started placing criminals in a highly unstable antimatter universe. Hyperion says that he doesn't have time to debate their science. He deals in cold, hard American facts. Banishing them to the negative zone is the only way to effectively contain criminals as powerful and as dangerous as Victor Von Doom. Now, before they continue this unnecessary conversation, who's escaped, Reed? Ben says that while they were putting Doom through, all of the other bums managed to get out. Go get him, big hype! After using his atomic vision, Hyperion finds his first set of escapees. His former friend Gladiator and his Imperial Guard are attacking Cape Canaveral. Gladiator and the lot have been infected by the Brood. No doubt they were trying to commandeer a space flight back home. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the luxury of being gentle for old times sake. Next up was the other dimensional nuisance, Mr. Beyonder, bending reality to his warped whim and turning the good people of Arkansas into flying sharks. While having his tongue tied in miles of supernauts, he screams things like, 
This world is built on lies, and Hyperion is the mightiest liar of them all. Even processing his thoughts at super speed, the words still linger in the back of his mind. They trouble him more than they should. What does he mean that this world is a lie? How is any of this a lie? But the threats don't end there. Over at the Daily Bugle, the Shutterbug, Peter Parker, finds himself stuck between a wall and a miniature hive of annihilation. Even being that size, if General Annihilus and his wave of insect minions escaped, they could decimate the American economy in hours. And after that, it's time to deal with a bigger problem, the larger-than-life Ultron. Henry Pym was a friend of Hyperion's, a good Christian, decent husband, fun-loving, ant-sized sidekick until his automaton experiments consumed him. Literally. It's hard to tell if there's anything left of Henry inside this cold metal monster. Once he disposed of the metal giant, that leaves him with one final menace to handle. The Hulk. However, the Hulk tries to tell the children of Busima High that he is in fact crazy. And he quickly corrects himself to state that that is not what the Hulk means. Thoughts are backwards. Hyperion bursts through the school wall, punching the Hulk outside, asking, Why did you come here? How do you know about my secret identity? Hulk slams his fists together. Hulk knows too much. No world wrong. People wrong. Hulk's friends missing. Where are Earth's mightiest heroes? Where are the Aven? But before the Hulk could finish his statement, Hyperion tells himself that he coddled the beast for too long. Deep down, there was a part of him that hoped that maybe, just maybe, the Hulk could be a force for good. But that was foolish of him to think. A monster is a monster. He goes to grab one of the Hulk's arms and finds himself kicked away. That's when the Hulk grabs for his other arm, yelling, Hyperman always good friend to Hulk. Hyperman not need to open eyes. Hulk remembering enemies and liking it. Please make Hulk happy. You love Hulk when Hulk happy. When Hulk grabs Hyperion by the neck, Hyperion tells him, I do hereby invoke Executive Order SSA-1939. May God have mercy on your soul, Bruce. Using his atomic eye lasers, Hyperion has to kill the Hulk two dozen times before he stays dead. He screams hello over and over until he's little more than a quivering puddle of radioactive goo. And with his last words, there is a cry calling out to Steve. Where Steve? Could the Hulk have meant Steve Rogers? The man who was mysteriously lost to the world not so long ago? Hyperion digs through the records from the Pentagon, seeing that Steve Rogers went down somewhere over the Arctic Ocean. From everything the files said, America tried what they could to recover the remains. But even still, Hyperion checks every iceberg. He looks for the body of Steve Rogers every inch of the sea floor with his own eyes, and he could not find any trace of Captain America, of Steve Rogers. However, he does find something else. Deep inside of an ice fissure, there are signs that someone else was there recently, removing something from the ice. Now, they may not always see eye to eye, but it might be time to bring in Nighthawk, the world's greatest detective, to make sense of all of this. But before that, Hyperion goes for a soak in the sun to clear his head, to remind himself of the truth. Captain America is long dead. Hyperion is the super sentinel of liberty. Now and for all tomorrows, this world is the truth of all truths. It is everything that he could have dreamed of that it would ever be. And even if it is somehow a lie, he will fight like hell to keep this exactly the way that it should be. It was all quiet out in space. The soft black of nothing space drapes over reality's edge like the curtains before a call, and only the stars peek through to hint some distant drama waiting to take place. There are no eyes upon him or cries for help, no critics or cues to break the stillness. Here, Hyperion is alone. He imagines floating in this place forever, the lone sentinel of the seamless inertia, his heart unbothered by time. Atop the hall of the Magister's Mercy, a micrometeor tossles his hair and gamma rays ricochet harmlessly across his skin, the last eternal smile. But what good would this kind of peace be if he had no souls to share it with? You see, there is one that Hyperion would do anything to share this moment with. Her name is Oracle. As Hyperion comes back into the ship, the rest of the Imperial Guard welcomes him in, stating that they can't let their friend spend their last day with him sulking alone. Hyperion laughs. What did I do to deserve such good friends like you? Gladiator tells him that they have taught one another a great deal, but he still clings to his Terran humility. 
He should be proud of the honor and glory that he has brought to the Imperial Guard. Hyperion tells him, I am proud, and I'm grateful, but I promised not to bring down the mood of our last day together. Oracle tells him, you better not. Clearing the mission log doesn't mean that he's done with them just yet. Manta says, technically, their mission log isn't clear. It would be a shame to send Hyperion back to Earth with one loose end left unexplored. Deathbird is finally out of the picture, but we never had a chance to investigate her hidden keep. Gladiator tells them all, I hate to pull rank, but it'd be more practical to send a cleanup crew in to explore the ruins, considering who gave us those coordinates. Hyperion may have earned the Starjammer's respect during the Asante siege, but I have never been one to trust the word of pirates and enemies of the state. Manta says that they have nothing to gain by lying. Deathbird's hidden keep is sealed within the negative zone. Those pirates knew the coordinates, but not the way in. However, Hyperion does. Remember those rogue Chitauri constructed a cross-dimensional window? Hyperion's atomic vision is the only thing that can wield it shut. Gladiator laughs. Huh. These coordinates are between us and the Chandelar. So we wouldn't be violating orders, and we would have an easier time sorting through Deathbird's leftovers than the general infantry. So what say you, Hyperion? Would you step into the unknown one last time? Of course, the question was moot. Hyperion would have said yes either way. It wouldn't be a good idea to disobey orders on his very last day. As the Magister's mercy reaches the space-time ripple, Hyperion gets into position using his atomic vision to pierce the veil into the hidden ruin. Here, in this bubble dimension, Deathbird hoarded spoils. Among the tropical anti-gravity islands and lush fauna of the extinct Edens, she planned to enjoy her ill-gotten gains, insane and alone in the splendor of her fortress home. And now that the Imperial Guard has managed to defeat her, is not everything that this place has to offer theirs by right? As the crew steps out onto one of the dozens of islands, Flashfire feels something crawling on his neck and he slaps it. Neutron calls out that they should go check out the lagoons, and Flashfire tells them that he'll be right there. He just had a bug or something on him. However, what they don't see in the trees is a pair of eyes staring right down at them. And as the team splits up, Hyperion and Oracle investigate on their own, but once alone, he asks her if she's decided yet. Tells him that tomorrow they will return to the direct service of Magister de Ken, and he will return to Earth. Hyperion will be away from his group and away from her. The stars would spin them further apart, and they may never meet again. She has made her decision, and that is a pain that she cannot bear. Let Gladiator demote her. Let her parents threaten her. By the eternal sky, let even Magister to Ken himself object. When he is to return to Earth, he will not do it alone. His is a soul worth leaving home for, Marcus Milton. As they embrace and kiss, Gladiator calls over the radio that that's enough, lovebirds. Have you finished checking the perimeter? Because we're about to unlock Deathbird's terminal here. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Flashfire pops out of the water stating that his neck is really starting to kill him. Neutron jumps in, stating that he should be over there then. They'll make him feel better. Flashfire says that he is so not in the mood. He should be happy that the show-off is leaving, but seeing him and Sybil, Neutron gets closer, stating that they are boring, yet the gravitational pull between them, it's undeniable. Flashfire says, okay, that was cute. As the two of them kiss, Flashfire begins to feel a little weak. Neutron says, hey, are you feeling all right? Don't get me wrong, that was great, but not worth passing out over. Flashfire tells him that it's just kind of burning, since that sting like his muscles are on fire. Flashfire hops out of the water, sitting beside a tree, stating that maybe they should go get everyone, just in case anyone else is getting sick like him. Neutron says, of course, and as he leaves, Flashfire begins to laugh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then we can all be together. <laughs> just, just one last time and feel better. Over inside Deathbird's fortress, everyone begins to look around and Oracle asks, why does it look like no one has been here in eons? Gladiator says probably because they spent the last several cycles chasing her across the galaxy, but Manta's onto something. The lab was sealed off, protected. Some kind of quarantine protocol. As the screen lights up, Manta sees an image stating that there they are. Now, what secrets have you? Oh. 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 Oh no! Gods, no! Everyone looks up and Hyperion asks, Brood? What is that? Oracle tells them that they are the greatest threat to sentient life in the entire galaxy. Manta then follows up stating that they are a parasitic hive mind. They thought them to be extinct, hunting and eating and swarming, converting all life to servant hosts or egg-laying spawn. 
Gladiator tries to reach out to the others, but nothing comes back, and he says that it might already be too late. So Manta says that if that is the case, they have only one course of action. Past a certain stage, a matter of minutes in some cases, the infection is permanent. Hyperion gets ready to leave, asking why is everyone waiting then? And Gladiator stops him. Careless action is what drew us here in the first place. We must be cautious. We cannot allow the brood to escape this place, no matter what. Oracle then says that she can get a reading if they just get outside to see what everyone's thoughts are. Everyone hurries outside of the fortress, and when Oracle goes to scan, she feels something scream, and she begins to yell, Spread and spawn and hunt and hurts and spread and spawn! They are brood! Everyone else is lost! As she points forward, Flashfire and Neutron and the others slowly creep out of the trees, infected, ready to attack. Hyperion and Gladiator get to work keeping the brood back, but suddenly Hyperion feels a prick on the back of his neck. Gladiator tells him to be careful, but Hyperion says that it didn't work. He felt the parasite, but his body just destroyed it instantaneously. Manta says that it's possible that the concentration of atomic energy in his body doesn't allow for a brood egg to take hold. As Flashfire attacks, Gladiator stops him, and Manta asks him if he understands. She whispers something after, and then says that there's no other way. Gladiator nods, stating that if that is the case, so be it. Her sacrifice will not be in vain. Manta then flies up, stunning the brood, telling the others to run. Damn you! Run while there's still a chance! Gladiator takes off, stating that if these brood get to the Magister's mercy, they can pilot it back out and spread it across the stars and end life as they know it. But even Deathbird, mad as she was to try and capture these creatures, was wary of their escape. Manta discovered a failsafe in the world's design, a hidden keep that sits like a bubble along the surface of the negative zone. Any force strong enough to gain entry is strong enough to collapse it. Hyperion asks, so you want me to use my atomic vision to pop the bubble? Gladiator tells him that that is exactly what he wants him to do. The opposite effect got them in. Their friends are lost now and the brood must not be allowed to return in their current state. Hyperion hands Oracle to Gladiator, stating to be sure and follow once the pathway is open before it collapses. Oracle, Sybil is everything to me. Please be careful with her. Hyperion flies over to the tear and gets ready when he hears a sudden scream. He looks back to see Gladiator struggling with Oracle and he tells her, I am sorry, but she is lost. I cannot hold her for long. It is her or it is everything. Do you understand? If you ever loved her or me, if the lives of your comrades have any meaning, you must close this now, Hyperion. Hyperion screams as he unleashes the full power of his atomic vision, destroying the tear and everything along with it. For a moment, he feels it once more, the seamless inertia. Time stands still. He imagines himself floating like this forever, and then time bursts its dam like a river. Here, all is quiet. The soft black of space unfurls, and the shards of barren debris along with it. Save the stone beneath his feet, every atom in creation spins further and further away. Some fundamental, some peace within his soul abandons him. Here, Hyperion is alone. Many years ago in the great city of Manhattan, the young Peter Parker took a field trip to General Tectonics, and it is here, right here, life would be changed forever. This would be where Peter got his start by being a superhero after being bitten by a radioactive spider that escaped its cage. However, that is not what happened. You see, when Flash Thompson knocked Peter to the ground, the spider didn't bite him. Instead, it got stepped on. Peter would grow up to never gain his spider powers, and Uncle Ben would never be out and ultimately meet his end. So Peter would finish up high school like a normal teenager, and later go to the Empire University and focus all of his attention on electronics. One day while working on his drones, Aunt May called, stating that she was actually going to be in the city. Ben was going to take her to the new production of In the Heights, so she needed to stop by Gamble's and get a new dress. She thought that maybe her and Peter could meet up for lunch. Peter tells her of course, and when she's done shopping, they meet up at a coffee place just off campus. So to pass the time, Peter takes his drones out for a field test, when suddenly one of them spins out of control. One of the drones crashes into a tree and a dive bomb straight into a passing by student. The young girl screams, and as Peter runs over to make sure she's okay, she tells him that if he's working on a project with drunk assassin drones, she sees an A in his future. Peter blushes, telling her that he's sorry. It was actually something he saw in a dream once, flying. Actually, he was swinging through the air, so he made it. The girl then says that it's pretty impressive what he's got going on here. Her name is Caroline Trainer, pleased to be knocked out by his drone. At that moment, the hero Hyperion shoots across the sky with Caroline yelling, Holy cow! Hyperion? How cool! 
Peter says that he's off to save someone, no doubt, and Caroline then asks if he thinks that his drones are fast enough to catch up to Hyperion. Peter tells her, yeah, but it's the range that he's worried about, and she laughs, telling him that she would sure like some footage of Hyperion up close. Peter puts back on his headset and says, as you wish. Up ahead, Hyperion catches up to the villain Hovermaster, with Caroline poking Peter, asking what is he seeing. He watches through the camera's drone, telling her that he's not sure yet. Hyperion is fighting some G-list supervillain, and it looks like Hyperion is getting mad. He's using his atomic vision to cut down a sign, and it looks like he's throwing it- wait, Gambles? Hyperion, don't! As the sign crashes into the department store building, Peter begins to rush over calling for Aunt May, but at the same time, Uncle Ben calls. Peter doesn't answer the phone. And as Uncle Ben goes to voicemail, he tells Peter to not forget that they need him to puppy watch tonight. Once Aunt May gets back from the store, they're going to be heading out. He tried calling her too, but she didn't answer. Anyway, call you back when I can. Love ya. However, May wouldn't be coming home. She passed away. A casualty from when Hyperion destroyed the department store. Afterwards, Robbie from the Daily Bugle asks why would someone with a 4.0 grade point average be in his office looking for a job as a photographer? You see, time has passed, and so has May. So Peter needed to move on with his life. And he's back at the Daily Bugle, just like he's destined to always be. Peter looks away, stating that there was a death in the family a couple months ago. His aunt and his uncle went to pieces. He needs help taking care of things, like they took care of him. Before he dropped out of EU, he developed a drone camera system that might be great for the Bugle's digital strategy. Give the residents and the tourists a look at New York from a different vantage point, a virtual one. Robbie says that that is a bit too squishy for him, but this, if he can get footage like this from the heroes working in the city, footage that no one else has, then yeah, he's got himself a job. Peter asks, you want me to document Hyperion's every move? Sure, what's the pay? J. Jonah Jameson swings open the door telling him, it pays nothing. You're lucky that Robbie's such a damn softy. So later, Peter stops by the rebuilt department store and Ben says that he thought he'd find him here. Peter asks why he isn't at the cemetery and Ben says that he didn't need to talk to May. He needed to talk to him. Come with me, son. As the two sit in the park, Ben goes on. May wouldn't want to see you like this, isolated, distant. You're just walking around aimlessly and it's scary. Peter asks, is it because I'm not home every weekend for a sad dinner in which we don't talk about anything and I feel worse? <sighs> ben takes a deep breath and then says, we can fight, but I didn't come here for that. At least it'd be something. Peter then asks, what does he want then? I want you to be the man that we raised, a man who engages with the world even when it beats him down. A man with a purpose in his eyes and not get angry at the world. Peter grabs a newspaper pointing to a picture of Hyperion stating, This, this right here, is my purpose, Uncle Ben. Taking pictures of what heroes do with all the power they have. I'm not special. Ben hugs Peter. You don't have to have great power to do great things, but first, you do have to want to. So the next day, Peter gets ready to try and take pictures when suddenly he is surrounded by a swarm of miniature insects. Peter says that Hyperion has super hearing, right? Oh, great googly moogly! Hey, good buddy, you got your ears on out there? Old chum, compadre? Don't suppose you got maybe a minute to spare for your best friend in the whole wide US of A? At that moment, Hyperion lands on the rooftop with Peter telling him that he's got this. Feel free to document these events. After using his freeze breath, Hyperion kneels down, stating that the bottled hive of Annihilation, it's been cracked. If General Annihilus and his wave of alien minions should escape even at this size, they could decimate the American economy in hours. Once he's finished, Hyperion takes down Ultron, telling Peter that he has finished taking out most of the villains from the negative zone, but there's one left. Keep your head on a swivel, Peter. Something tells me that there's still more to be done. As Hyperion flies off, Peter scoffs. <laughs> Jerk. But neither of them noticed the small hive alien that Hyperion missed. Back inside, the people in the office begin to ask Peter what happened, and he tells them that, you know, Hyperion doing Hyperion stuff. One of the men asks, how did he happen to get his signature? But before he could finish his sentence, his head is suddenly cut off. At that moment, small lasers begin to shoot off of the building, and Peter says that it must have been one of the Annihilation aliens. As the alien begins to destroy everything in range, Peter runs to the office kitchen and quickly throws a fire extinguisher into the microwave to create a distraction. After it explodes, Peter yells to everyone that they need to get out, now. And once everyone is gone, Peter watches the bug, asking what now? The thing's gotta have a power source, right? Maybe he can short it out. He grabs an umbrella and then cuts a power cord and begins to pull at its wires. He wraps the umbrella up and then jumps from beyond a cubicle, waving his arms, trying to get the alien's attention. The alien quickly spins around, rocketing towards Peter. But as he waits for the perfect moment, Peter opens the umbrella, shocking the bug and then smacking it until it dies. 
As he finishes, Peter begins to feel weird and then he sees the bite mark on his arm. Ugh, maybe my timing wasn't as good as I thought. At that moment, two sets of arms tear through Peter's clothes and his skin begins to turn green. He looks at his changing skin and states that he has been infected. He's a danger to everyone. He could still take innocent people out. He, he has finally found his purpose. Maybe it was here all along. It just took a weird ass spider bite to bring it out. It was another day for everyday teacher, Mark Milton. When one day during class, he felt something coming from the outside of his classroom. After changing into his superhero form, Hyperion, he went outside to see a homeless man sitting along the school building. He asked the man if he needed help, but the homeless man said probably not, though he could definitely use some help. Just listening to that history teacher's lesson and all, he's catching up on a few things that he missed. Hyperion tells him that if he doesn't have a child that attends here, he's going to have to leave. The school has already had a trying week. The man gets up. Nice school. Even got its own superhero looking after it. Some humdinger of a world we're in, isn't it? Something is off. Hyperion's atomic vision can't scan this man. He asks, do we know each other? The man tells him that he doubts it. He's just another homeless old vet that the world's forgotten. He woke up one day and realized that he'd forgotten something that might have been important. Hyperion asks, and what was that? The man holds out his hand. The truth. Pleasure to meet you, Hyperion. Hyperion reaches to shake the man's hand and it starts to hurt. Why is Hyperion feeling weak? The man goes on stating, you're a man of American might. If you don't mind to be saved, you should take a day off. You're not looking too hot. Hyperion tells him, right, well, I'd like you to come with me and... But before Hyperion could finish his sentence, there's a gust of wind and a blue flash before the man disappears. Up ahead, Blade tells the old man, look, I understand that all of this is frightening, but no more running away. You've seen the world. Now the question is, does any of this make any sense? The man turns. I'm sorry about before. You wake up from a long sleep and find a vampire standing over you telling you that your whole reality is broken. Instinct starts punching and you run. But I've seen her enough to know that you're right. This is all very wrong. God help me. What else did I miss while I was forgotten in the ice? Blade tells Captain America that he should probably sit down so they can go over everything. He wants to talk about the Avengers. Cap tells him, no, don't tell me, show me because the two of us got a lot of work to do. For Stanley Stewart, the man otherwise known as the superhero Blur, life is anything but normal. Being the fastest mortal alive does have its advantages though. Like being able to watch 48 TVs at once, have a shoe closet that's bigger than most houses, and go on five dates at once across three continents. Oh, and also keep up with about 20 phones going off at once while posting about 500 selfies a day. Yeah, Blur doesn't get to relax that often, mostly because work tends to keep him on the run. Like that time that he was trapped in the secret Siberian lair of the Soviet super bear Ursa Major and his artificially evolved man-eating minions. If the friendly neighborhood super speedster would have to outrun the fiercest jaws on, wait, that isn't what we were talking about before. Has this adventure even happened yet? Anyway, it all started in Washington, D.C., when Silver Witch was chasing him with her high-speed hexes, telling him that she was going to finally have her revenge. Witch blames Blur for the death of her no-good brother Pietro, after he burned himself out trying to keep up with yours truly. However, the Silver Witch hit him with a whammy of a hex and ripped his soul right out of him. Without it, he'd fade away and die just like the imitator Pietro. What's worse, the Silver Witch has brought them to the Dread Dimension. Imagine if everything that was mind-rippingly awful had a zip code. This is that place. All the witch has to do is keep his astral self away long enough so that the physical will wither and die. So in other words, the race is on. Oh, do we forget to mention that there are mindless ones here? Yeah, that's a thing as well. So it begins a race through the dread dimension to save his soul by the hyper-fast host of Hogoth. Here we go. The silver witch is fast, but blur? This isn't exactly his first super race through the impossible. He once raced from one end of the multiverse to the other, against death and her ring-powered infinity chopper. He even raced through time itself to stop Doom 2099 and his super spiky time sled from mucking with the American history. But thinking about that gives him an idea. 
he could run faster than light and vibrate out of sync with himself, out of sync with time, and go streaking through his own timeline. The only problem is that the next thing he knows is that he's re-racing some of his greatest showdowns, like against this guy, Johnny Blaze, the speedster of vengeance, the ghost runner. Spoilers, he ran so fast that Johnny's bones melted. So after taking a power nap for a few years in the 33rd century, it's time to... Wait, what was he doing? Oh right, Silver Witch and his soul are being taken and blah 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 blah, let's catch you up again. All he has to do is tear through time so that he could skip ahead to the part where he went and take his soul back. Except when he comes back, the Silver Witch zaps his powers. The next thing that he knows, it's like he's stuck in melted adamantium. He could barely move and, oh God, is this what it's like to be normal? This may be the mile that finally kills him. But wait, think back. All those years ago when he first went to the mystical monastery of Kamar Taj in Tibet. He was going crazy from his super speed powers when the mystical art showed him the way. All he had to do was look at a flower, sit and look. It slowed him, grounded him even, and all he had to do is breathe. Some races you can't win by running. Took him a long time to learn that, 17 days to be exact, which for a super speedster is a lifetime. His name is Stanley Stewart, the blur, the fastest mortal alive, and he has the attention span of a hummingbird on meth. All he knows is what he sees, with all of his focus, with all of his eyes, to see the life racing past of just beyond the doors of perception, to see everything that you miss going by. And by the groovy moons of Manapur, it's time. Up ahead as the Silver Witch runs, she is stopped by a giant mystical whale that crashes in front of her. She looks up asking what in the world is that, and Blur says that he's pretty sure it's called a Wrath Whale. Sounds fearsome, but they're pretty peaceful. Now it's time to take back his soul and take her home. Back to Ravencroft Asylum so that she can hang out with the rest of the Super Loonies. And once the Hex wears off, he's on the run again. Things are back to the way they should be, aren't they? Now we go to the backup of this issue. It is true that Ravencroft is the home to the most criminally insane superheroes, and that sometimes the prisoners act out towards one another. Like one day, Bullseye wanted to see if he could kill a man with his own bloody tooth. However, Bullseye was stopped by an exploding rat. The fire from the rat burned so hot that it was burning his soul. And there's only one flame that can burn so hot. The fire of the Phoenix, harnessed by Warden Maya Lopez, once known as Echo. And that's exactly what the world is right now. An echo of the way it's meant to be. It just can't be a coincidence that she gained the cosmic powers of the Phoenix when whatever the hell happened, happened. She woke up and realized that the reality that she knew was gone, somehow remade during the night. She still doesn't understand everything that the Phoenix Force can do or what she can do. All she knows is that the Phoenix is a gluttonous beast that is always hungry. The way a bonfire hungers for a barrel of gasoline. If the whole world went away, was it because she couldn't control this damn power? She could leave the asylum anytime that she wanted. She could fly off and touch the stars. And she didn't. Because that is what the Phoenix would do. And sometimes just being an echo of what comes before you isn't enough. Sometimes you need to be different. Just then, Maya notices something and calls out to the person in the shadows that they may have thought that they could sneak up on her because she's deaf, but they should have gone with an aftershave that doesn't smell like blood. Blade peers out from around the corner, stating, I like this one already. Right behind him walks out Steve Rogers, telling Maya, I won't lie, your powers frighten me, even in the hands of someone who has wielded it for years. And according to Blade, the last time that we saw you, you had just gotten a hold of it. Or it had gotten a hold of you. A power that can literally destroy the world. Blade tells her, Yeah, turns out that that's exactly what we gotta do. Burn this whole reality to the ground. Cap then says, Hopefully, we can bring back the world that we lost. And for that, we're going to need more than fangs and a shield. Maya Lopez, we're putting a team together. Emma looks out as the wall crumbles, revealing Magneto and his mutant force. Come with us, I'll explain on the way. But Emma shakes her head, explaining that there is no need, that she saw everything in their minds when they stepped into the cell. She saw the battle with the Squadron Supreme when the mutant force led a protest against the mutant registration bill. 
She saw Charles Xavier cut in half by Power Princess. She saw Magneto crippled by the woman moments later. She saw Rogue attack the Skrull named Skymax, held him for too long and absorbed all of his powers and memories in revenge of him killing Mystique. And she knows that Magneto has tried to take Charles' place, gathering mutants to a safe haven known as Island M. But it was three days ago that Magneto sat in his study. His head bowed as he heard a voice in his mind and he felt hope once again. Charles, he gasps, and Emma stands from her bed. This jailbreak has assuredly alerted the squadron to your existence. For a daydream? She asks Magneto, but number one and number two shake their heads and one explains that she heard Xavier in Magneto's mind. This mission will help mutants be less scared. The giant and his comrade step back through the hole that they blew into the wall, but suddenly a gunshot echoes in the room and the duo mutants fall to the ground, their shared mind once destroyed. As the mutant force steps outside, they're greeted by the Phantom team, armed with weapons that can't be manipulated by Magneto and psychic blocks that can't be affected by Emma. No problem, Frost. Some of us fight with our hands. Frenzy shouts as she leaps at the soldiers. The mutants launch their attacks at the guards, trying to fight them off. But finally, Magneto controls the metal of his chair and sends the shards stabbing through the phantoms. As Emma helps Eric off the floor, she points out that the squadron will be here shortly. So let's get to work, Eric tells her. A short while later, the mutant force has returned to Island M in the Bermuda Triangle. Emma looks over at the island before stepping back into Eric's study. She looks at the gathered mutants, telling them they will have to go deep into Eric's mind to find Charles. If we find Charles, we will be at the whim of one of the world's most powerful telepaths, defending himself like a wounded tiger. She explains as they all take a seat. We all know the risk. Sabra, keep watch until we return. Eric tells her. And the mutants all lean their heads back as Emma begins to work, and in a blink of an eye, the study has disappeared and the mutant force stands amongst the ruins of a civilization. Emma, I've never seen this place. What's it doing in my mind? Eric asks as he looks around at the destruction and she looks around explaining that they are in the outer boundaries of Xavier's mind. Clearly, he's been redecorating, she whispers. Eric is shocked, wondering how they couldn't have noticed Xavier was there, buried in his mind after his death and Emma looks at him. Charles chose this moment. Some part of him is ready to be saved, she explains. Rogue looks around, finally beginning to recognize things. This is Power Princess's home, Utopia Island. Suddenly from the rubble, skeletons begin to arise to combat the mutants. The professor nuked her people inside Mag's head. She bisected him. If it were me, my revenge would be twice as legendary. Emma nods, realizing that Xavier is lashing out with his mind, the mutant force moving to fight against the Utopian skeletons, and Rogue uses her scroll powers to shift form and lash out, but she is stabbed from behind. As she screams out in pain and opens up her eyes, she is shocked to find herself in Eric's study. Rogue, what's going on in there? Sabra asks, and quickly Rogue explains what happened and how she woke up, when suddenly the proximity alarms begin to blare throughout the mansion. It's a good thing you did, Sabra tells her, explaining that Hyperion and Power Princess are on Island M, and right now Magma is trying to hold them off. If we're lucky, we got minutes, she explains, but back inside of Magneto's mind, he asks what happened to Rogue as they continue to fight. Suddenly, the ground quakes and cracks beneath their feet, and the team begins to fall through the air. They land on the grounds of Xavier's old school, where he taught his first five students those that would become the mutant force, and they look up seeing statues of the first students standing before them. Charles and his child soldiers, Emma sighs, and Jubilee moves past them to the door of the inner mansion. Outside, the mutants are doing their best to hold up Power Princess and Hyperion. Reaching out her hand, Jubilee shoots sparks into the door, when suddenly it explodes, showering Jubilee with flames, sending the team flying. Meanwhile, Frenzy is diving to protect Eric and Emma, but when they look up, both their fellow mutants have disappeared as they gasp awake in the real world. The sounds of battle and destruction reaching their ears. Inside the mansion, Emma and Eric discover a large version of Hyperion. In his hands lies the body of Charles Xavier. Charles, it's him. After all these years, Eric whispers, and Emma looks up at the body, which is still cut in two. Indeed, and his state raises an intriguing question. Which half of him have you come for? She asks. Eric looks at her, ordering her to step aside so that he can save his friend when he failed him before, but Emma's words give him pause. This monument to his killers is his final defense and sure to be quite dangerous. Charles came to you to heal and once freed, 
He'll need someone he trusts, and I've been known in rare moments to be prickly. She tells him as she sends a psychic blast to cut through the image of Hyperion. The blast kills her, and Emma snaps open her eyes in the study, awake in the real world, as she hears the sounds of destruction and walks out onto the balcony. Oh, you've started without me, she whispers, and she looks down at the mutants fighting against the members of the Squadron Supreme, transforming herself into her diamond skin. Hyperion and Power Princess, finally, a chance to voice my concerns with my former hosts, she whispers before leaping down, and in his mind, Eric moves through the rubble. Look what's become of you, old friend. He whispers as he finds Charles' body. Eric! Charles gasps, and outside, Emma leaps into battle, cracking Power Princess across the face. Sorry to keep you waiting, Princess. Your queen has arrived! She snarls, and above them, Rogue has shifted into a scroll to fight against Hyperion. In his mind, Eric leaps over Charles, apologizing for not being able to save him before. He explains that he has done everything that he could, but his anger has not been enough. We need your heart, he tells his friend. But Charles looks at Eric, explaining that compassion wasn't what kept him alive all these years. Your anger did that. I survived as a broken idea in your brain. Only the master of magnetism can knit me back together. <sighs> Charles gasps, and Eric holds out his hands, beginning to fix his friend. Then why have you called me here? It can't be this simple. But suddenly Charles reaches out, grabbing the sides of his head, a deranged look appearing in his eyes. It's not that simple, Magneto, but it will be painful. <laughs> he smiles, smirking. Outside, the mutants continue their battle against the squadron, but Hyperion bellows in rage, tossing them all aside. This doesn't have to happen. You could have taken what you were given, he tells the mutants who fall around him. As the rocks hit him in the side of the face, he turns to see all of the mutants of Island M have gathered there. They are throwing rocks. They are doing all that they can. They are standing against the mightiest man on the planet Earth. You fight against the mutant force. You fight a whole species. Inside of his mind, Eric is feeling Charles draining the energy out of him. You're not Charles. He gasps and the man smirks again, just wearing him like a suit. He explains that he felt Charles' death, that as a sword cleaved through him, she sent her mind over into Eric. Charles didn't escape death. I did, yet I spent years recovering from the trauma. Then I called and you came. Your friends tried to warn you, but I knew you'd be so desperate for Charles Xavier to be alive. You pressed on, brave and stupid. This was never a rescue mission. You fell into a trap, Magneto. Outside in the real world, Hyperion slams his fist into the ground, sending the mutants flying. The mutant force get back to their feet, jumping at him to bring him down again, and Power Princess turns, grabbing Emma by the throat. Jubilee appears, shooting sparks into Power Princess's face. Hyperion throws the mutants aside, hitting them with a nuclear vision blast. Finish this, Zarda! Spectrum's on his way to clean up the scene! He orders her. But suddenly they begin to disappear, their bodies disintegrating into atoms. They both scream! And they're suddenly gone. The mutant force looks around, shocked at what happened. Well, somebody's been hiding some talent, Emma notes as she dusts herself off and Rogue shakes her head. No one here could have done that. They all just burned away, she says. But suddenly there's an explosion and a bright flash from Eric's home. This isn't over. Frenzy gasps and a familiar figure appears before them and Jubilee's eyes widen in shock. Professor, did you just blow up the Squadron Supreme? Those ants have been deposited among the outer planets. It'll be weeks before they can return. Weeks I do not intend to waste, the woman tells her. Jubilee's eyes widen. You're not the professor, she whispers, and the smoke clears as the woman explains that she's mutant kind's new alpha. Tearing you free of the dark with the power of a star gone Nova. Cassandra Nova tells them as she floats over their heads. They gather on the blue area of the moon, the earth floating far away. Our peoples have been at war since the sky was first blistered by the stars, since long before the earth was a home to anything that lumbered upright. But on this, even the scroll and the Kree can agree. For the greater good of the galaxy, we hereby endorse this murder. The delegates from the Kree and Skrull empires nod. They are not the only species gathered today, though. Members of all different races in the galaxy have gathered to hire the bounty hunter. If you people have my money ready, Rocket will bring you the head of this Earth Law man. Rocket Raccoon nods. 
I am Groot. His living weapon asks and Rocket nods, pointing back at the others questioning. What has this man done to anger all of you? I mean, I've heard the stories, but they surely can't be all true. He scoffs, but Yuata turns from his place in the shadows. I assure you they are. I was a silent witness to his atrocities for far too long. Until I could stand no more, I sought to intercede. The Watcher says as he turns into the light, revealing his burned eyes that now see nothing. Dr. Spectrum must die. Elsewhere, Thanos screams in pain as Dr. Spectrum blasts the Infinity Rings from his hand. With the villain defeated, Spectrum flies to his Black Sight prison in nowhere. The severed head of a god celestial that Spectrum killed to prove a point. The prism powers him and he blasts away from the prison, but he stops as a voice shouts out to him. Hey cowboy, where do you keep the flock heads around here? Ah, never mind. Found one! Rocket shouts as his space bike opens fire. The rockets slam into the spectrum, throwing him away, light leaping out of the prism, destroying the other rockets. Let me guess, Rocket Raccoon, supposed to be the deadliest bounty hunter. I gotta say, seeing you, I'm finding that hard to believe. Spectrum snaps. Rocket screeches his bike to a stop, pulling out his Groot weapon. Oh, you'll believe it, buddy. Right before I turn your big stupid head into space mist. Thanks to my big, awesome gun. <laughs> I am Groot. Groot says as he opens his mouth, firing projectiles at Spectrum. As the wood rounds fly through the air, they open their mouths, screaming, I am Groot! Spectrum tries to shield himself, wrapping a wall of light around him, but the Groot rounds get through, begin to grab him and root through his body. Spectrum screams out in pain, but the prism doesn't hear him. It begins to float away as the Groot rounds tear at Spectrum's body, roots wrapping around him as Rocket pulls his bike up to the prism. What's that prism thing anyway? Wonder if crazy old Quill on the junk moon would give us anything for it. And Spectrum rips his arm free of Groot, reaching out for the prism, but Rocket pulls out a new gun, firing the Charolite maggots at Spectrum. The maggots begin to burrow into Spectrum's body and the soldier gasps. Prism, why have you forsaken me? When suddenly Rocket reaches out to grab the prism, launching through the air, slamming it into Spectrum's body and sending out a shockwave of energy that blasts Groot and the maggots off of him. As Groot burns away, Spectrum sends out another energy blast at Rocket, destroying the Groot gun. Someone sent a space rodent to kill me with a gun that shoots splinters. I am Dr. Spectrum! Spectrum shouts angrily and Rocket dies for cover as Spectrum creates a light gun and begins to blast it at him. So you killed my big gun! Big deal! You think it matters to me? Rocket shouts from behind an asteroid. He gets on the radio to his ship and begins to whisper. Rocket to Mothership, I got no more guns. Fire all antimatter mines and nega bombs at my position and get the flock out of here at double speed. No matter what happens to me, just take care of. But suddenly his body begins to burn and he screams as power begins to fill him. Spectrum floats in close, gun at the ready. Don't go screaming on me yet. Not until you tell me who hired you and that bunch of kindling you thought that would kill me. Spectrum snaps. The asteroid explodes and Rocket floats out glowing with energy. His name was Groot, and I'm the star brand, and you, you're a dead sack of a spit! He snarls as he unleashes a blast of energy at Spectrum. The two beings fire at each other, energy blast destroying asteroids all around them. Spectrum is shocked, knowing that he threw the star brand into the negative zone years ago. He creates a wall of tanks that blast at Rocket, demanding to know how he found that power. But Rocket refuses to answer, instead creating a cannon that shoots stars at Spectrum. With a sweep of his hand, Dr. Spectrum cuts through the stars, sending them careening off into space. You think I've never killed a star before? He explains that he has been to realities that Rocket couldn't even imagine, such as the Necroverse. The prison begins to glow as a cancerous monster shifts and appears. I absorbed the entire rotting reality into my prism to keep it contained, but I don't mind letting it out now and then to stretch its legs. Your gun shoots a few measly stars, mine shoots a whole universe of cancer! He shouts as the blast hits Rocket, cancerous tumors growing on his whole body almost instantly, and the bounty hunter screams in pain. After the battle, Dr. Spectrum spends some time dipping Rocket's head into a supernova until he talks. And after he dies, the star brand drifts away. 
On Rocket's ship, a message plays for the young Starbrand, telling her that she needs to take care of herself. The little girl cries, gripping her hands, and the symbol of the Starbrand tight. Back on Earth, Colonel Ledger meets the President at a church in Washington, D.C., and he explains about Rocket and the aliens that hired him. I'll deal with them soon enough, sir, Ledger promises. President Coulson nods. Of course you will, son. You're the finest soldier I've ever met. But Ledger brings up another thing that has been bothering him. How the Blur was telling the team at their last meeting that after his fight with the Silver Witch, he saw that their universe was wrong. This isn't how it's supposed to be. Sounded like nonsense to me. If anything is wrong, I'd know about it. And they both look up from their place in the pews, looking at the altar of Mephesto that takes up the front of the church. I'm sure you would. Nothing gets past my Dr. Spectrum. Coulson nods with a smile. But back in deep space, Starbrand rockets out of the ship, glowing with energy and anger. Groot, bring me to Earth! She bellows, and Groot reaches out for her as Starbrand explains that she knows the universe is wrong, and she's going to fix it. Suddenly, a portal opens behind them, and the pair see a sleek spaceship drawing closer. On board, a radio transmission is sent out. This is Captain Okoya of the Star Panther Mackendall, with an urgent message for the Wakandan Space Command. We found her! We have the Star Brand! London, England. The guards and the robots stand ready for trouble on the bridge. A van stops and two delivery drivers get out. Finally, some fresh meat, one of the guards notes as the pretty redhead steps forward. He attempts some flirting and the woman smiles at him. What he doesn't see is that when she lifts her pen and clicks the top, she activates the EMP in the back of their van. Lights go out all around them and the robots hit the ground. Black Widow pulls out her pistol, aiming it at the guards' faces. Some bots are down. Inside must be lined with anti-EMP tech. She tells Hawkeye she pulls off her disguise. Couldn't leave one for target practice? Hawkeye asks, a third guard moving to hit the alarm button, but Fire Ant is already waiting for him, kicking him hard in the jaw. With the bridge secured, a portal opens, allowing Baron Zemo and the rest of his team to arrive. Go forth, my siege society, and do what must be done. He commands, and he turns to Sabretooth, ordering him to fully secure the area and have fun with the guards. Be a good dog and go play fetch, Soviet agent tells him as he readies his shield. The two of them rush forward, bullets ricocheting off the Soviet agent's shield. Sabretooth leaping over his head and attacking the guards, and the agent radios in that the LZ is secured. Hardly broke a sweat. You said there'd be more fighting on this op, Zemo. Sabretooth growls, and on the bridge, Fire Ant finishes his reconnaissance, learning that the secret squadron base is directly below them. Zemo nods, marching along the bridge, monologuing about how he will free Europe from the rule of the Squadron Supreme and bring it under the control of Hydra. Wanda, execute containment and control protocols. I don't want our guests arriving early. Wanda nods, casting a spell, making it appear as if everything is normal on the bridge. After that is done, the team gathers around as she creates another portal. In a flash of magic, the team appears in the secret base below them. Startling, Tom Thumb. Bollocks! What in Mephesto's name? He shouts as he drops his drink. Agent Shield spins across the room, knocking out the tiny man. Ah, we found our first sacrificial lamb. But another portal seems to open up in the wall, allowing tentacles and water from the Thames River to wash into the room. The team scatters as the tentacles wrap around them. Yeah, gross! Fire Ant shouts as he is squeezed, and from the water, the amphibian appears attacking the team. You dare attempt to breach these hollowed halls! He shouts as he knocks Sabretooth away. Without looking, he whirls around, grabbing Soviet agent by the throat, calling out to Tom Thumb, but a shock suddenly lashes through his body. All right, we've had enough of that, Hawkeye says with a smile, and Zemo draws his sword as he crosses the room. I applaud your efforts, fisherman. Know that there is much honor in bravery, and now I honor that bravery with a swift death. He swings his sword, cutting Amphibian's head clear from his body. And with this done, Zemo turns back to the team. Creed, I need you to flush out Blue Eagle and whatever mage created this portal. Go in so much fear and confusion. I want them to know that fear is part of their cleansing. Inside his secret lair, Nighthawk receives the report about the attack on the bridge, and he hits the comms, getting in touch with the Blur, asking the speedster to meet him on the bridge. Are you sure this isn't a false alarm? Blur asks. I need you to get your head in the game. We have people in that base that are counting on us. The Hawk Jet can have me there in 20 minutes. 20 minutes? That's like years from now! 
Blur complains as he finishes the food that he got while running through Hawaii. Inside the base, Sabretooth and Soviet agent continue to hunt. Suddenly, they're attacked from above as Blue Eagle descends on them, his powerful mace slamming into the Soviet agent, anger filling Blue Eagle as he mourns the loss of his brother in arms. He slams the mace down again on Soviet agent. Big mistake, Birdie. You're gonna regret bleeding one of ours. Sabretooth shouts as he dives at the hero, but a golden arrow slams into his forehead, stopping him mid-leap. Ye think he sells foxes set loose to prey upon a helpless hen, but... Know then, rogues, that you have wandered into the wolf's den, for I, the Golden Archer, carry naught but death. Golden Archer calls to them from the rafters. Sabretooth rips the arrow out of his head. It's gonna take more than a little twig to put me down. And another arrow slams into his forehead. What to suffice? Golden Archer asks, and Blue Eagle slams into Sabretooth, continuing the battle. Hawkeye jumps into the room, pulling out his own arrow to fight the Golden Archer. He shoots a fire arrow, but Golden Archer counters with an ice arrow. A triple arrow is countered by a quadruple arrow. Hawkeye jumps from behind cover, laughing that the Golden Archer can't shoot around walls, but a ricochet arrow bounces slamming into the wall by Hawkeye's head. Yikes! And over this! Hey, Scott! Might need an assist on this one, buddy. Hawkeye shouts over the comms, and Fire Ant rushes into the room, chased by Tom Thumb. He shrinks and jumps onto one of Hawkeye's arrows, allowing the archer to shoot him across the room. Thy aim is as crooked as thy twisted heart! Golden Archer laughs as he dodges the arrow, but Fire Ant suddenly grows from behind him, stepping on him. Bigify! That's probably not a great catchphrase. Fire Ant notes, and inside the control room, Black Widow finishes putting the virus into the squadron systems, letting Zemo know that he can tell the world about this secret base or simply blow it up, but her job is done. And with her job done, she informs the boss that her end of the contract is complete, and she's pulling her guys out. A pity you won't see what's in store for Nighthawk and the Blur, Zemo tells her as he bids her farewell. In the base, Blue Eagle and Arachna continue to fight against Sabretooth and Silver Witch. Blue Eagle continuing to pummel Sabretooth and Arachna and Silver Witch trading powerful spells back and forth. Arachna hits her with a stone spell, knocking the Silver Witch down, but the magical energy surges inside of her and Wanda looks at her enemy. No more you! She shouts and with a brief look of shock on Arachna's face, she suddenly disappears. Wanda then turns and hits Blue Eagle with another spell, breaking his body as he falls, when suddenly a super fast punch cracks her across the jaw. Damn it! Arachna's gone! Blue Eagle is down! I wasn't fast enough! Blur shouts, and Nighthawk descends from his hawk jet, standing before Sabretooth. We fight now and mourn later. Nighthawk tells his teammate, and Sabretooth rushes at him, yelling, I'm gonna tear Nighthawk apart! But the hero sidesteps, tossing Sabretooth easily. Doubtful, he says simply. Sabretooth quickly gets to his feet, discovering a bomb stuck to his shoulder. The explosion then rips him apart. Blur begins to move through the base, taking out the other villains as Silver Witch chases after him. She continues to chase him as he tries to reason with her, explaining that she'll burn out before she catches him. She smiles and throws more spells at him, explaining that she doesn't have to catch him. Just buy Zemo more time to kill Nighthawk! Blur stops punching her hard in the face, and then he looks around, realizing that they have run to Poland. He whirls around and begins to run back towards the secret base. Back at the base, Nighthawk has met Zemo in battle, and the two lash out at each other, dodging fists and swords. Zemo laughs, explaining how long it took them to find a team that can easily infiltrate the squadron's secret base and defeat its secret members. Nighthawk whirls, throwing his haka rings at Zemo's side, but Zemo whirls, kicking the hero's legs out from underneath him. Inside the base, Black Widow moves to gather her team, but finds Blur waiting for her. As he goes to get her, he makes a move to grab her, but as he gets close, she hits her own body with a widow's bite, allowing the energy to arc out and hit him. Damn it! Trained for six months and it still hurts like hell. She hisses as she helps Hawkeye to his feet. She gathers the others and they quickly sneak out of the base. Now, back at the top of the bridge, Nighthawk and Zemo continue their fight, and as they trade blows, Nighthawk explains that he figured out Zemo's plan months ago, that it was easier to leave the base as bait than hunt you down. I'll admit, I didn't plan for all of this death, but that's a weight my soul will bear until the grave. Nighthawk snaps as he blocks another kick, grabbing Zemo's arm and twisting around him, snapping the bones, but Zemo lashes out headbutting him. Shut your mouth! Zemo snarls as he readies his sword, but Nighthawk is there, kicking him hard in the face, grabbing him by the throat. Zemo gasps at him, defeated. Cut off one head, and two more shall take its place. I'll be waiting. 
Nighthawk snarls as he slams Zemo's head into the ground, standing over the defeated villain, listening to him groan in pain. In a flash of motions, the Blur is standing by Nighthawk, glad that his teammate survived. We stopped them like I knew that we would. Nighthawk tells him, and quickly, Nighthawk explains the plan to Blur, who is shocked that he would allow the secret base to get out. And what do we do when the next fascist picks up Zemo's sword? We keep cutting. Nighthawk says simply, and Blur turns to him. Is that your way of justifying us losing people? Nighthawk doesn't answer. And in the darkness of the night, Black Widow and Hawkeye escape. Nighthawk returns to his lair, waiting for the next crisis, as Hyperion floats in the darkness of space, watching out for the planet Earth, and the Blur sits in his own lair, trying to find something to occupy his speedster mind. Sam Alexander moved through the Science Museum, amazed at how small their planet was in comparison to the rest of the solar system. Suddenly, one of the walls explodes as MODOK charges into the room, burning through one of the displays, shouting at everyone around him, You imbeciles thought you could keep such a valuable asset hidden in plain sight in this mundane museum! But you are wrong! The Omega Stone is mine once more! He shouts as he pulls his treasure from its hiding spot, but a blast flies through the air, hitting the villain. I knew putting this stone here would be the perfect bait. Stand down, you godforsaken freak, or I'll melt your hide and launch your husk into orbit. Doc Spectrum orders as he charges onto the scene. But Modok will not be defeated as he uses the Omega Stone to sever the link between Spectrum and his prism. Sam rushes forward. He wants to help his hero, and he reaches out, grabbing the prism, which senses the heroic nature inside of him and for a brief moment. Sam is granted the powers beyond those of normal humans, and he uses them to defeat MODOK, earning the praise of Dr. Spectrum. A portion of the Prism's power continued to course through Sam Alexander, and he became Dr. Spectrum's sidekick, Kid Spectrum. Another young superhero, known as Kamala Khan, got her start working as an intern in a museum in Jersey City. She quickly discovered that the head curator was selling utopian artifacts on the side. And when she discovered this, she quickly went on to Power Princess's website and tried to warn her. Knowing that she had to act, she began to look through the stolen goods and discovered a utopian circlet and bracelet. She charged forward the magical items, giving her the strength of 10 men, as well as the speed and skill of a utopian warrior. And as the goons were defeated, Power Princess arrived, who was surprised to find Kamala, who quickly gave back the items that she had found. But Power Princess took Kamala as her sidekick, dubbing her Girl Power. Now on to another superhero, Miles Morales was always a fan of the superheroes that he saw on TV, with his favorite being Nighthawk and the Falcon. And after Falcon was killed, Miles decided to use his genius to invent his own costume, taking up the role of Falcon. One night, Nighthawk was fighting against the Scorpions, the heroes on the ropes, and Miles Morales descended from the sky as the new Falcon. The Falcon flies again! He shouts as he and Nighthawk teamed up and took down the villains. And after the supervillains were down, Nighthawk stalked towards the young hero. What in Mephesto's name do you think you're doing? Isn't it obvious? This was an audition. I'm your new partner. Miles shouted with glee. But Nighthawk becomes angry, yelling at Miles. The Falcon isn't just a costume. He was a friend of mine, a friend who died because I couldn't save him. Nighthawk turns and begins to climb the ladder back to the Hawk and Jet. If I see you in that costume again, I'll tear it apart and dump you in juvenile detention. But Miles knew that he just needed to prove himself to the hero. So he sought out friends, and he partnered up with both Girl Power and Kid Spectrum, and together they formed the Young Squadron. Now the young squadron descends from the sky, brought to the scene by Girl Power's circlet, sensing utopian energy. All right, let's get in there and stop them before they cause more damage. Kid Spectrum shouts, Young squadron, strike! Falcon shouts, and they descend on the Wrecking Crew, a team of supervillains that gained their powers from utopian artifacts, and they fight Power Princess on several occasions. Falcon flips over Piledriver, throwing his Falcon Blades at him, and Girl Power launches herself at Wrecker, managing to stop his magical crowbar with her bracelets, while Kid Spectrum trades Energy Blast with Thunderbolt. Suddenly, a bomb bounces into the battle, filling the area with smoke. Falcon, was that you? Kid Spectrum asks as they all begin to cough, but the smoke swirls as a deranged figure charges in. Wrong go, younglings! It's your friendly neighborhood, Deadpool! 
Deadpool shouts as he whirls his hammer, cracking Falcon across the jaw. And I brought my best hammer just for you, Flyboy. No fair. We're fighting the other bad guys. Kid Spectrum shouts as he tries to hit Deadpool with an energy blast, but Deadpool grabs him, tossing him back into the sleeping gas. Here's a tip. Life isn't fair, youngsters. He shouts with glee as he picks up Falcon's body. Girl Power continues to cough, but tries a move that she has seen Hyperion do. She claps her hands together with super strength, blowing the sleeping gas away from the scene. A few moments later, she and Kid Spectrum are on top of a nearby roof. They know that Deadpool took Falcon, and they've got to find him. Kid Spectrum's phone pings and he looks at it to discover an internet blogger named The Whisperer has already posted about their defeat. Girl Power whirls on him. Wait, that's it! So a short time later, Rick Jones, also known as the famous superhero blogger known as The Whisperer, is on the phone about a potential Hyperion story. He suddenly turns around to discover Kid Spectrum and Girl Power in his apartment. You should really get those security bars checked, Girl Power tells him as she drops the bars that previously guarded his window. She moves forward demanding to know how he's been tracking them and Rick refuses to answer, but Kid Spectrum leans towards his computer setup. I bet I could short out every one of these with a snap of my finger, he says with a smile. And finally, Rick caves, explaining that he figured out the signal wavelength on Falcon's suit, which is how he's been tracking their movements. If he's in wireless range, I can find him, Rick promises. Meanwhile, over at the nearby amusement park, Wakey wakey, your birdiness! Deadpool calls as he slaps Falcon across the face. Ah, where am I? Falcon asks as he comes to, but Deadpool slaps him again. Ha ha! The question should be, what will your last words be? Falcon is confused about what Deadpool is doing, and the villain stands explaining that he made a promise a long time ago. What is dead is dead. The Falcon is dead, and you are the Falcon. Ergo, I must kill you. Deadpool says as he looks back at the young hero. You're crazy. I'm not that Falcon. Miles yells at him, and Deadpool smiles. Oh, I know, kid. The name has been retired, so to keep my promise and break Nighthawk's heart all over again, I'm gonna kill you, he says as he holds a can of gasoline and a lighter. Falcon begins to struggle, telling Deadpool that they aren't on a bridge. Of course not, that'd be way too derivative. I'm gonna fill this coaster with gas and light it up so your burning effigy does loop-de-loops. That's more my style. He begins to dump the gas all over Falcon, asking for any last words, but an energy blast knocks the gas can from his hand. You're done, you sick weirdo, Kid Spectrum says as he flies in. Deadpool smiles, pulling out his sword as he asks if Kid Spectrum thinks that he can take him all by himself, when suddenly the ceiling collapses on him as Girl Power charges in, punching him. Nope, but I'm not alone, walnut face. Kid Spectrum smiles. He grabs Falcon and quickly frees him from his ropes, evaporating the gas off of him. Girl Power continues to punch Deadpool in the face, asking if he's had enough. He tries to zap her, but the electricity only fries him and leaves her untouched. You had to know that wasn't going to work, Deadpool. Uh, it was built to be used against Nighthawk, not super strong lamos like you, he tells her. And in Deadpool's mind, the narrator begins to close out the issue, but he shouts at the narrator, ordering him to stop. Stop closing the issue, we're not done. Uh, who is he talking to? Girl Power asks, and Deadpool looks at the trio, shouting at them. That's all a shame. These heroes you worship, they're not what they appear to be, and you know it. How many times has the Squadron Supreme unleashed violence because they enjoyed it? Horrific property damage because it's the only way they know how to win. Constant lethal force on targets in the name of peace, righteousness, and the American flag. Earth's mightiest heroes extend their powers all over us. They're Avengers with nothing to avenge he tells these kids. And a short time later, Girl Power and Kid Spectrum stand by as Nighthawk apprehends Deadpool. He stops and he looks at them. I heard you two are running around with that kid who thinks he's Falcon. Do you know where he is? I want to help him, Nighthawk tells them, and the look on his face says that he doesn't want to help at all. They shake their heads, promising to call him if they see Falcon. Good answer! Deadpool whispers with a wink and a smile. As Nighthawk leaves, Falcon comes out of hiding. The trio know that Deadpool is crazy, but what he is saying is right, and Girl Power agrees, but they know that they can't bring the Squadron to justice on their own. But we can still show everyone a better way. We've got to stand for something more than just power. We can't be the young Squadron anymore. Let's be the heroes that we should have always been, Falcon agrees. We're not just heroes, we're champions, Girl Power tells her friends, and they all smile as the sun comes up behind them. You know, that's not a bad name, Kid Spectrum says. Growing up, Nighthawk knew that his parents never wanted a son. This was made abundantly clear, even as a child. They all abandoned him to butlers and boarding schools, long before they went and got themselves killed. 
Still, he used to try and tell himself that all the work he did each night was for them. Like somehow their rotting corpses swell with pride. But those are the desperate lies of a lonely child. These things that he does in the dark, he does them for himself. When you grow up without the simplest form of human affection, it creates a ravenous cavity inside of your heart. And when you find that you cannot fill it with being loved because the world has no love to spare for the likes of you, you learn to settle for being feared. There are plenty of people in the halls of Ravencroft Asylum with similar stories. Even as an imposter guns down officers claiming to be the better Nighthawk, there are resemblances. They're all broken. They're all living outside the law, all of them trying to fill that void, one night at a time. But it doesn't take long to stop Craven the Hunter, just some smoke and a hit to the back of the head. Inside these walls are murderers in padded cells, and he is the hero who put them here. However, when Nighthawk looks into the eyes of these lunatics, what bothers him most isn't their crimes, it's how deeply he understands their rage. And that understanding now makes him punch their sick, grinning faces all the damn harder. Where once there were sounds of rambling madmen, it is now replaced with those same madmen killing each other in a particular laughter, echoing above the chaos. The worst of the worst that has been set loose inside the mother of all madhouses. And as Nighthawk fights his way through the masses, the laughter grows louder and louder, attempting to crawl into his mind, and that's when he sees them. Years earlier, Nighthawk's first run-in with this creature was when he returned from Battleworld wearing an alien costume. Now one of his greatest enemies, it's a mask that came to life and tried to kill him. Fighting that along with Dr. Octopus's Octopi, it makes for a very challenging situation. However, the long press of a button to release a sonic blast never fails to stop the alien in its tracks. But that's not the worst of it. The worst is yet to come. You see, deeper inside Ravencroft, there's another laughing, one more sinister, more evil, more insane. Goblin calls out from the fifth floor that he is just in time. You remember Dr. Gwen Stacy, right? Of course you do. Though you may have called her Nightbird, always with the sidekicks. Gwen yells that the goblin is trying to get him to kill them. No matter what happens, don't do it. Don't give the sick creep the satisfaction. Goblin dangles Gwen over the ledge, stating that that is such rank unprofessionalism after he was being so civilized in taking a vote. Now, what were we voting on? Oh, right. Does this jumpsuit make me look fat? As the goblin lets go of Gwen, Nighthawk is reminded that this is the self-made maniac that did the same thing with his partner Falcon all those years ago. However, when Nighthawk threw his hotter ring to catch Falcon by the leg, the sun had just gone down, activating his alchemaic blood, causing the pull to be too much for Falcon's neck snapping it. Not again, Nighthawk tells himself. He will save Gwen, just have to swing in and catch her. But as he does, he starts to untie her, telling her that it's going to be okay as she yells, Damn it, it's too late! You should have just let me die! Her head snaps back, looking at him as the smile on her face stretches way beyond the limits of a normal smile. She has been infected by the goblin gas. Nighthawk says that he's sorry, but he has to end this and throws his night blades to keep Gwen back. Instead of dodging them, she lets most of the blades hit her arm, telling him that she is sorry. It might be the gas just making her just crazy enough to see how wrong they've been all these years. Gwen turns, throwing the blades, hitting the goblin in the face, but the damage has been done before Nighthawk could stop her. He falls to the ground laughing, telling her that she was such a good girl, always liked her. A Nighthawk fights off more of the inmates, telling them that he isn't dying just yet, with Goblin asking if he's sure, and he slams the blades in further. Nighthawk rushes over as Goblin coughs up. The agony! It's too much! Put me out of my misery! Nighthawk radios to Luke that he needs the paramedics, but Goblin says he has one final request. It's why he threw this little shindig. You hear the craziest things when you're in a cell next to the Silver Witch. Just wanted you to know on behalf of all of us here at Ravencroft, don't let the world change back. I don't know about you, but I really like it this way. As the medics come in, Nighthawk goes back to his cave to see what could have even happened, wondering how did he know that the world has been changed from the way that it was. Is the world the way that it is meant to be? Is anything ever 
The only thing that he does know is that with every fiber of his being that he is where he belongs. He wouldn't want to be the man who tried to tell him otherwise. And as Nighthawk watches the video of the escapee Echo, he notices two men with her, and someone is carrying a star-spangled shield. Meanwhile, back with our Avengers. High up above the Washington Monument, Nighthawk battles against a masked foe, one with the likes of none that he has countered before. He is quick and cunning and seemingly on par with every move. This man's weaponry is something unheard of. His sword can cut through the adamantium hawkerangs with ease. Just who the hell is he? And why is he trying to sneak into the Squadron Supreme headquarters? The man thinks to himself that he wants to get in because he knows where the secrets of the world are but that would be a lie. Nighthawk lunges at him and he seemingly disappears into thin air. Moments later, in the northeast part of Africa, the masked man appears, but his suit begins to change, taking on the form of a panther. The man calls out that he knows that they are there, as well as the fact that they don't belong here. Show yourselves! Two men step out of the brush, and one tells him that he's right. They don't belong here. The light shines on them, revealing Blade and Captain America as they walk up, and Cap tells him, Neither do you, T'Challa. You would think being in Washington, D.C., home of the Squadron Supreme of America, that it would be the safest place in the world. But no, nothing's changed. It's been years since Luke Cage was locked up. Here he is, behind bars. However, Luke wasn't thrown in jail because he did something wrong. In fact, quite the opposite. As the police commissioner, this is actually the perfect place that you'd want to be if there was a deadbeat thug who had information that you wanted. And just as the cell door swings open, Richie is thrown in, and it would seem that Luke picked the right time to be locked up. Luke just looks at Richie, telling him, Hey, funny running into you here. How about we have ourselves a nice little chat? Richie gets up yelling to the guard to let him out. Hurry, Luke Cage is in here! And Luke tells him, That's right. The honest guy who got banged up for a crime he never committed. The guy who became a cop just to make sure nobody else would have to face what he did. I'm the most honest guy here. And then there's you, Richie. A persistent offender with a string of convictions. So if something were to happen inside of this cell, who do you think everyone would believe? So later that night, Luke turns on the Nighthawk signal and waits when only after a few moments he hears a voice asking, How long did it take? Luke laughs, telling Nighthawk that he barely managed to get through the whole most trusted police commissioner routine before they started giving him a chapter and a verse. Nighthawk asks what is the Turk planning, and Luke hands over a note telling him that he's meeting with Gunter tonight, half past ten, this is the location. Nighthawk takes the note, but as he leaves, Luke stops him, telling him that they didn't need his help for this. There's more, isn't there? Nighthawk looks back, telling him, you're making a lot of enemies. Just remember, you're not bulletproof. Now, Luke and Nighthawk, they go back a long time, and over the years, they've grown to trust each other, rely on one another sometimes. Probably the closest thing to a friend that Luke's got, and this is the first time that Nighthawk has left a present behind. While reports of masked vigilantes in red who have been attacked by criminals known as the Saints are played across all the media stations, the Turks' crime family gathers for some chili to discuss their next plan of action. The Saints have been disrupting business, and most of the people are too scared to go out onto the streets. The Turk laughs, telling everyone not to worry. He's got it under control. DC's finest are being thrown at the problem. We just gotta let those tax dollars that we ain't paying them with work for us. But just then, one of the Turk's informants runs in stating that they have a huge problem. Richie has been picked up. Which is actually a huge problem, considering that the Turks' people are supposed to be off-limits because of their... arrangement with the police. So Turk makes a call, and the man on the other end asks, Who do you want me to hurt? After sending over a photo of Luke Cage, the man says, Shoot! I'll take care of this one! On the house! Once the man hangs up, he continues putting on the rest of his police uniform. Later that day, Luke, along with detectives Misty Knight and Jessica Jones, stopped by the Church of Mephesto to see cleric Matthew Murdoch, or Matt, as he requests to be called. Luke says that he isn't one for churches, but lately they've been getting a lot of criminals coming in, all with one thing in common. Everyone, including their most recent criminal, Lonnie Lincoln, who was barely alive after being attacked by the saint, are all people who regularly attend this church. There wouldn't be any sort of connection, would there? 
Matt says that 70% of the nation are devotees to Mephesto. Some are teachers, some are doctors, some are even criminals and police officers. Mephesto does not judge. And as they leave, Misty and Jessica state that they will try and talk to Lincoln in the hospital, and Luke tells them okay. Keep in touch. I've got a television appointment. Later on Channel 4's DC Talk Show, the anchor says that that just about does it for their show today. Any message for the viewers at home, Lieutenant Saunders? The lieutenant, the same one that Turk called before, says that there's nothing that the police cannot handle. If people don't do anything wrong, they have nothing to fear. Luke laughs, adding that the public needs to leave the policing to the professionals. If they all ran around with masks over their faces, how would they know the good ones from the bad ones? As the camera turns off, the anchor turns to both Luke and Saunders, stating that she appreciates them coming on. She knows that they're both busy. Luke shakes her hand, telling her that it's not a problem. However, even though Luke and Saunders are working for the same team, Luke doesn't like Saunders, specifically his methods. Whatever the situation is, Saunders' first response is usually heavily armed. Backstage, Luke tells Saunders that even though they sometimes butt heads, they have a few points that they can agree on. And as Luke takes a closer look, he notices a pin above Saunders' badge, asking him what is it. Saunders says that it's just the Mephesto flame. Surely he's seen it before. Luke tells him that he has, but he doesn't like it. It doesn't belong in the uniform. They may have the freedom to express faith, but when he wears the uniform, he represents the law. So the next time he sees him, it better not be on there. Later that day over at the hospital, Jessica and Misty make their way to see Lonnie when they bump into Matt Murdock. Misty says that it's a surprise to see him here, and Matt smiles, telling them that he's just administering to the sick, doing Mephesto's work in the world. However, he's very busy and must attend to some other matters. Do take care, detectives. As Matt leaves, both Jessica and Misty shrug their shoulders and walk into Lonnie's room, and when they see him, he's been smothered with a pillow. Misty shouts asking what the hell happened here, and a guard comes in stating that he doesn't know. The only person who has been in here was the priest. The two run out. Misty calls for an APB on the priest from the Church of Mephesto. A one Matthew Murdoch, six feet tall, Caucasian, red hair, wearing a red cleric suit. Approach with caution, believed to be the vigilante known as the Saint. Later that night, Luke gets a call from Jessica telling him that they managed to track down Murdoch. He's holed up in the house of Mephesto. The bad part is that the situation has kind of escalated. Misty's bionic arm got busted and Saunders is in there with his boys. He's looking to end it, possibly in rubble. Luke races down to the church yelling, what the hell is going on here? And Saunders tells him that everything is under control. Luke tells him that this isn't control. This level of response is inappropriate, but Saunders tells him a police officer has been assaulted. How appropriate does he think that they need to be? Luke then begins to walk up to the church, telling them, you got all of this for one man who attacks people with a baseball bat? If you were looking to make a martyr, you could have done better. Tell everyone to stand down. I'll establish a dialogue first. But as Luke leaves, Saunders laughs. Who's looking to be a martyr, sir? Once inside, Luke calls out to Matt, telling him that they just met this morning. He'd like to have a talk. We can work this through. Just then, the saint cracks Luke in the back of the head. Luke fights back with a table, telling him, I just want to talk, saint. The saint gets up yelling, don't call me that. It's not my name. And Luke asks, then what does the S on your costume mean? Matt takes off his mask. It's not an S, it's a serpent. Mephesto took the form of this lowly creature when he wanted to experience life in his creation. Don't call me the saint, just call me Matthew. Luke tells him it's okay. They can get through this and Matthew tells him, no, it's not. I spend my days listening to people tell me about the, all the bad things that they've done, about the darkness in their souls. They think they're cleaning their slates so that they can go out and do it again. I had to stop them. You understand, right? Luke says that he thinks that he can understand that. Matt goes on telling him that Mephesto created this world around them, all of them in his image. They are a pale reflection of he who breathed the life into them. Yet every day he looks at the people who worship Mephesto and all he sees is violence, hatred, and bitterness. They are vile creatures. And then he will ask himself if they as people are the reflections, then what does Mephesto truly look like? And a few moments later, Luke walks Matt out, holding the bat, telling everyone it's okay to stand down. They're coming out. But as all of the officers continue to keep their guns aimed, Saunders tells everyone to take the shot. Misty yells, wait, they can't do that. The commissioner is in the line of fire. Jessica pulls out her gun, telling him to call off the order. And Saunders laughs, telling her, I wouldn't do that. 
He then yells over the radio to take the shot and suddenly everyone opens fire. Bullets begin to spray everywhere with Matt taking most of them. Luke tries to pull Matt down to give him some cover, but just as Luke thinks that this is the end, he begins to hear a tank over and over and he looks back to see Nighthawk over him with his cape extended, shielding them. And he asks, do you not understand the word careful? Once the bullets stop, Luke carries Matt back to the others. And when he looks down at Saunders, he punches him. You're fired. Later, Luke tells Nighthawk that he's sorry about Turk, but Nighthawk tells him not to worry. There will be other days where he isn't going to have to choose between a criminal and saving the commissioner's life. Luke then holds out the bulletproof vest, telling him, Thanks for the loan. Not exactly bulletproof skin, but it's close enough. Nighthawk laughs as he leaves, telling Luke to hang on to it. I get a feeling you're going to need it again. It all begins here, Pilgrim. A tale so breathtaking and tragic, we can't yet show you the title. Don't you dare skip to the end. We know it's hard to wait, but there's plenty of drama for you to get through first. Our story begins as Nighthawk, who is just slow enough returning from the Alterverse to save poor Harry Osborn from falling into a coma. Even though Gwen Stacy and Sam Wilson are by Harry's side, Nighthawk knows that this calls for him to take off the mask and show his support, not as the mass hero, but as Kyle Richmond. It seems that Harry has gotten himself into a heap of trouble when he used the ever-growing popular street drug, Super Serum. Everyone thought that Harry managed to get past his habits, but being the son of Norman Osborn could drive a person into dangerous territory. If anyone is to blame for this happening, it's Norman himself, everyone says, though they do not know that Norman himself has overheard that conversation. So later as Kyle leaves for Capitol Hill, he knows that it would be easy to blame Norman. Not only for being a bad father, but also because Norman is none other than the criminal mastermind known as the Goblin. The Goblin has unwittingly been a thorn in Nighthawk's side for many reasons, notably when he attacked Nighthawk in the Night Cave, finding out Nighthawk's true identity. However, with an alchemy-enhanced punch, the Goblin was knocked out, hitting his head and causing amnesia. Nighthawk used what skills he had in the medical field to assist Norman on his recovery, but ultimately it wouldn't help the part of his memory that had been lost. After that, Norman had forgotten not only that he used to be the Goblin, but even who Nighthawk truly was. This brought guilt upon Nighthawk, the fear of having so much power. How could he ever trust himself that this wouldn't happen again? It wasn't until he met with the Falcon that he was reminded why he donned the mask in the first place, to inspire people to stand up for themselves. Meanwhile, in the unsettling stillness of the hospital room that Harry Osborn is in, Norman asks himself, could Kyle Richmond be right? Did he really do this to his son? Why, yes, yes, he did. He refused to accept Harry for who he was. He tried to make him into someone that was better, but instead he broke his heart. He is a failure of a father. He is the villain of our story. But as the machines in the room beep, they begin to cause Norman some distress, sending flickering images into his mind. What are these images? Why is Nighthawk standing over him? Villain, villain, that's it! The way that Kyle said villain. Kyle Richmond is Nighthawk! And he is the goblin. He remembers everything. <laughs> but no, no, no. This isn't his fault. This is Nighthawk's fault. Nighthawk poisoned Harry. And now Nighthawk will pay. Later, back in the night cave, Sam Wilson gets ready to go out on patrol, telling himself that he still can't believe it. Him, a kid from the U Street corner, chilling out in one of the coolest headquarters old money can buy. But Sam's trusty feathered friend, Red Wing, notices something and cause. Sam says that if there's one thing that he knows, it's that there's something getting Red Wing nervous. And that would mean that something bad is, before the young hero could finish his sentence, a blast hits Red Wing and Goblin swoops in on his glider telling him that he's sorry that he had to do that. Out of the three, I actually liked the big chicken the best. Sam gets ready to take off, but Goblin throws one of his pumpkin bombs, destroying Sam's suit and knocking him out. Later, as Nighthawk comes back to the night cave after putting away Craven the Hunter, yet again, he feels an unnatural stillness in the air. And with a scent of brimstone, it doesn't take America's greatest investigator long enough to read the clue. He calls out to the Night Pooter to run a search for a tracking device. And as the Night Pooter displays Falcon's location, Nighthawk knows that Sam is in danger. And when the time calls for speed, Nighthawk quickly jumps into the Hawk Rod. 
he races to Chesapeake Bay Bridge to find Goblin, but with the sun still up, he would have to fight without his alchemic powers. Goblin yells that he has driven his son to self-destruction with constant badgering and self-insertation, and for that he must make a choice. Either leave this existence permanently or the Falcon dies. Nighthawk quickly climbs up the bridge knowing that he would be fighting at a disadvantage, but this is Falcon's life that they're talking about. Goblin manages to give him the slip at first, nearly knocking Nighthawk off of the bridge and back onto the hard pavement, but Nighthawk tells himself that he can do this. He has trained with the greatest fighters in the world. The Order of the Crane Mother, the Black Marvel, Princes Zarda. He is more than just his superpowers. He is still Nighthawk, even when the sun is still up. With a daring leap, Nighthawk gives it his all as he throws himself into the air, kicking Goblin off of the speeding glider. While Goblin recovers from the nasty hit, Nighthawk rushes to Falcon's side to free him, but Goblin has one more trick up his sleeve. So he hops back onto his glider, aiming straight for the two of them, smacking into Falcon, knocking him over the edge. Falcon plummets down towards the waters below, knowing that he won't make it in time. So Nighthawk throws his hawk a ring to grab a hold of Falcon's leg. There's a sudden snap, and as Nighthawk pulls Falcon up, He's unresponsive. Goblin flies by laughing, yelling at him what thrills, what drama, what timing! Well, except for the part where Nighthawk didn't realize the sun was down, and he was using his full night strength to catch the poor man's body. A force certainly just as lethal as the impact of Chesapeake Bay. It would have been fitting revenge to force a hero to watch his partner be killed before him, but it's so much better to watch a hero kill his own partner. <laughs> and with nothing but rage in his eyes, Nighthawk leaps off the bridge into the goblin, sending the both of them crashing into a car below. Police Commissioner Luke Cage hurries over asking if everything is okay. Why not let them handle it from here? And Nighthawk smacks him, telling him, no. This is mine. Goblin coughs, climbing out of the wreckage, stating, Kai! But Nighthawk stops him. Don't! Goblin gets to his feet, telling him, Sure, sure. Nighthawk, you're mad, I get it. But we should talk, right? It's what civilized men like us do. We can make a deal, right? Goblin continues to spin his words, buying time as the Goblin Glider rockets back towards our hero. Without even looking back, Nighthawk catches the glider, ripping the metal apart with his own bare hands, cutting himself in the process. Goblin doesn't taunt. Goblin doesn't laugh. Goblin doesn't say anything. He knows that there is nothing that he can say or do but cherish his last fleeting moments. The metal in Nighthawk's hand slices through within milliseconds on its way to Norman Osborn's neck. Kyle Richmond disappears into himself. He reminds himself of a speech he gave at the House of Representatives, that these new heroes have the power to save them from the forces that would disrupt their society, but they can't determine the course of their culture. They can use their strength to fight crime, but they can't make the decision for what justice is. Justice must always remain in the hands of the people. The hands of the people. Nighthawk screams as the metal gets closer to Norman's throat, but he stops himself, telling Commissioner Luke Cage that he's all theirs. Arrest the murderer. And with that, it's now time, my friends. The title we hoped we'd never see. The Death of the Dynamic Double. But one survived, you say? And yes, true believer. Nighthawk lives in body, but inside him, where once there was a light fueled by the night, there is only cold darkness. The old gog slams his fist into the ground, stating, Odin tasted like beard and sour mead. The one with the pretty horns was a foul brew of black magic and Jotun's blood. Didn't sit well. The rest tasted like a great deal of nothing. What do you suppose you'll taste like? And as the all gog begins to swallow his prey, he spits them back out laughing. <laughs> Soft and sweet, figured, just like a princess. And I've devoured plenty of them. Power Princess stands back up, wiping the blood and spit from her face. No, and I could promise you that you've never known a princess quite like me. And she was right. Power Princess came from an island of women who could drink anyone under the table. No matter who they are or where in the heavens or netherworld they sit, Power Princess and her sisters could surely be the ones still drinking long before anyone else could keep up. Power Princess places her hands on her hips, calling out the Algog, telling him that he is the greatest of fools. A deep bellowing howl can be heard, and the Algog says that it is a bold statement for anyone who is already halfway down his gullet. 
Power Princess holds out her hands, telling him, I, I was, but it would seem that I left something behind. As the Olagog stops for a moment, he feels a rumbling in his belly, and then suddenly a gauntlet shoots out, and Power Princess tells him that these were forged with Utopian Uru, and bound to her soul by astral chains. In other words, they come when their mistress calls. The Olagog falls to his knees, trying to hold his entrails together, but Power Princess puts back on the gauntlets and tells him to get up. She wants him on his feet so that she can end him. Later that night, Power Princess looks at her garden atop the Statue of Liberty, looking at more statues. Not only is she the strongest that there is, but her people also knew the ancient secret of turning flesh into stone. But Power Princess finds herself bored. It's been almost an hour since she spilled anyone's blood in anger. She could call on Hyperion, a sultry whisper is all it takes and he'll come streaking in like a big, lusty, muscle-bound warhead. But part of her fear is that it'll be one of those nights where he would drone on about the children or American history or the other things that are equally useless to her. Sometimes it's enough to make her miss the old days. Namor, now there was a man. You simply haven't lived until you've made love on the sea floor while sharks feed on the Nazis you've just torn to pieces. But as Power Princess reminisces about the old days, a thunderous crackagoom can be heard, and the princess knows that this is not just any lightning strike. She heads into her armory, digging through her weapons, thinking that the Algog hadn't been seen since he felled the last of his sworn enemies years ago. And it would seem that there's no coincidence that he returns now. There's a restless ghost stirring somewhere within the heavens. Where else to begin her search other than the great graveyard of the gods? where the Mangog became the final All-Father, where begun the Ragnarok Wars that left the heavens hollow, where she salvaged the last piece of a broken bridge to forge a rainbow axe in a realm once known as Asgard. Within moments, Power Princess is taken away to the ruins of Asgard with her axe, and when she arrives, something shoots past her. She looks around to see an object floating, and it would be a man who seems a bit out of place. She asks who he is, and the man, known as Thor, tells her, I'm not so certain anymore. I only know that I am sober for the first time in more eons than I can recall, and verily, I do not like it. I do not have any memories, but this feels wrong. This is not the world that I know. Power Princess asks if this Thor is the one who caused the unnatural thunderstorm, and Thor tells her, Tis not the storm that is unnatural. Tis everything else in this realm. I'm finally remembering who I was, only to find the rest of the world has forgotten itself or disappeared like everyone that I have ever. Wait, who are you? And how did you come by that axe? Power Princess throws the axe. Thank the heavens. She was worried that he'd be peaceful. Her name is Power Princess and let her show him why. The object swirling around, Thor deflects the oncoming axe and he looks at it asking, Beloved Bifrost, what in the name of Odin has happened to you? What happened to Asgard, the Golden Halls, the long ships sailing the stars? Not even Valhalla remains. What a father of my mother! Power Princess charges in, punching Thor in the chest hard enough to make him stagger. But as the flying object forces Power Princess back, it gives time for Thor to let out a thunderous belch. She shouts that she lost her people too, but he doesn't hear her whining about it so loud that she can shake the stars. Instead, she found a new home, new people, one worth fighting for. And fight she did. You know why no one missed the gods? Because of her. She punches again, shouting that she is the last daughter of Utopia, who did what no other god or goddess ever could. She actually earned the right to be worshipped. So on your knees as guardian and pray to your princess. But before she can deliver the final blow, an object shoots through, hitting Power Princess in the face as she asks, what is that blasted thing? It felt like Uru. Thor catches it and holds it. I remember. It was called Mjolnir, the Hammer of Heaven, and I am its master, the Lord of Living Thunder, the blood son of the All-Father Odin, the mighty Prince of Asgard. Power Princess comes running in. Enough talking! Show me who you are with punches! But Thor begins to fade away. I remember everything. I remember thee. However, it is too late, and with another thunderous roar, Thor is gone. 
Later, Power Princess gathers the rest of the Squadron Supreme, telling them that she has searched the ruins of Asgard and there was no sign of this man, except his last words are still echoing in her ears, in the ether. Have any of you heard of a team called the Avengers? Now for a side story, giving us a little more context. It begins in Iceland, the age of Vikings. Then, it was the night of bloodshed and for the first time in more centuries than he could count, Thor was sober. He watched the young princess Zarda before she became known as the Power Princess lob off her first head. All Thor did was sit and drink. Then in Berlin, 1945, Princess Zarda battled against the Nazis and celebrated with the American soldiers when they claimed the head of Adolf Hitler. Thor was there, sitting and drinking. But something was off. Zarda was there to stop Gore, the god butcher and his god bomb. There were versions of Zarda that came from all across time. However, the thing was, it shouldn't have been her. It should have been Thor. And now, Thor remembers. Thor can taste the storm ahead, and it tastes like hail and pain and raging Uru. All the things that he will rain down upon his enemies and upon the mysterious thieves that have stolen his life. This storm tastes like revenge. It tastes like fire. And at that moment, Phoenix appears before him, stating that she's going to take a guess. And the world's not exactly the way he remembers it, right? Well, he can call her Phoenix, and her friends can help with that. In the office of Dr. Gwen Stacy in Ravencroft Asylum, Gwen sits looking over her files on Bullseye, thinking back to something her mother once told her. It is the duty of the well to take care of the sick. Gwen's mother was a wise woman, and she knew something that so many supposed professionals overlook in their need to seem superior. One of the most important tools in helping others is to meet them at their level. And after watching her mother handle a patient who was ready to kill, and seeing her talk them out of it, Gwen knew what she wanted. To help people as they wanted to be treated, not as you want to be treated. Gwen sits back in her chair, stating that they will be starting an assessment in a few days, and until then, try to practice mindfulness. The guard picks Bullseye up out of his chair, telling him to move it, and then Dr. Stravinsky comes in, stating that it would seem that she is making friends. Gwen laughs, stating that everywhere she goes, really, there are the goblin files. Everything that he needs is right here. Dr. Skavinsky clears his throat. Right. Uh -huh. Also, um, do you have any dinner plans this evening? Gwen gets a text and tells him, Actually, I already have plans for the night. Perhaps another time, doctor. Later at the diner downtown, she says that if she keeps feeding her, there won't be any room for dessert. And they are supposed to go to that fancy rolled up ice cream place. Misty Knight laughs, spoon feeding Gwen, stating that they'll get to it. But what kind of friend would she be if she didn't insist on at least trying this? Gwen takes a bite, telling her that it is incredible. But she seems a bit tense. Is everything okay, Misty? Misty sighs, stating that she remembers the ricochet killer, right? DC's least favorite son interfered before they could catch him. Gwen says that they both know that she was the next target. And if Nighthawk didn't step in, she would have been killed. Misty tells her that as a DCPD detective, she'd be much happier if she got the chance to book him herself, instead of desperately trying to salvage her case after the cape's meddling interference. Gwen takes Misty's hand, telling her that she knows it's frustrating when the capes get involved, but she'd be lying if she said that she wasn't glad that she's safe now. Well, safer. Misty calls her the check and tells her, still, there's something wrong with capes that can't be fixed. And as she turns back, she sees Gwen looking off and asks if everything is okay. Gwen thinks to herself, she hates to keep secrets from Misty, but... At that moment, Misty's phone goes off and she answers it, her tone changing as she says that she understands. Gwen asks for a rain check on dessert, huh? And as Misty takes off for work, Gwen heads back to the night cave to do some research when she overhears on the radio that a murder has just recently occurred. She suits up, quietly sneaking into the residence of Nick Manilis. However, for Gwen, this isn't just a random victim. Nick was a cop who retired after the case went bad and he was injured. 25 years on the DCPD, handpicked by her father for his unit. He was there for her when her father passed. This was more personal. She looks at the window and notices peculiar scratch marks. And just then the door opens and Misty tells Gwen to freeze. But Gwen jumps out the window before Misty could even get close. She can't let her friend catch her as a cape. 
Later, Gwen cross-references all of the cases that she's seen that had those carvings, noticing a pattern with how all the victims died and how often there was hair left behind. She thinks on it and then it hits her. She says to herself, no. A while back when she was at Capital State University, she had a professor by the name of Miles Warren. He became obsessed with her, even started propositioning her. She put up with it for a while, but eventually she went to her advisor to explain what was happening. Instead of transferring her to another class, the advisor confronted Warren. Even her friend Flash Thompson wanted to knock some sense into him. After he lost his job, all of his credibility and his respect, Miles Warren lost his humanity and became the creature known as Jackal. He never blamed her. In fact, he just got more obsessed with her. He was later captured and put into Ravencroft, but a riot broke out and he managed to escape. And with not much to go on, Gwen rides over to the old CSU building in hopes of finding something. And as she finds some of the same fibers as the previous cases, lightning strikes and Jackal says, Finally, you came! What took so long? Jackal jumps down laughing. <laughs> I know you felt it. The connection that we have. Gwen asks him what connection. They're strangers. But Jackal asks her, Why continue the charade? I know that you're Gwen. How else could I have taken care of your problems? We were meant to be together. Gwen tells him no. He killed people who were close to her. He's sick. He needs help. Jacko looks at her. Those were obstacles, and I've gotten rid of them. Well, there is one left, but don't worry. She's next. As Jackal charges in, Gwen dodges, but there's something different about the Jackal. When they fought before, he would fight like an animal. Savage attacks with no strategy. But this, his reactions are instinctual like they were before. They're calculated. He's countering her moves as if he has years of combat training. Jackal jumps up and waits, and Gwen thinks to herself that he's watching her, studying her. Well, then it's time to use somebody else's playbook. As he leaps back down towards her, she kicks him back, firing her grappling gun into his shoulder, retracting the line, launching herself feet first into his face. He rips the line, falling back, telling her, do not make me hurt you! All I want to do is take care of you! He lunges one more time, but Gwen uses it to counter and slam him into the ground, ripping off the mask. And with it off, she sees that it's Flash Thompson. Wait! I did this for you! Back then, I thought that there was something wrong with me. I practically begged to be with you! And nothing. And then I realized it was her. Jackal made you afraid. So I knew I had to take care of him so that you could finally feel safe. There's just one more thing standing in our way of being together and that's Misty. Gwen leans in telling him that she is sorry. Just relax. Shh. And she sticks Flash with a needle. Gwen takes off her mask as he passes out. I've got you now. You're gonna be okay, I promise. Later at Ravencroft, Gwen sees Flash stating that they're going to help him. But he needs to meet her halfway. He slams his fist. I am meeting you all the way. We can be together. You don't have to be Nightbird anymore. As Flash is struggling, the guards get up and Gwen tells him it's okay. Flash is agitated and clearly delusional. Her presence is making things worse. She'll submit the paperwork to have him transferred to Dr. Jenkins. And when she finishes up and gets ready to go home, she sees Misty Knight is outside waiting. She tells her that she didn't expect to see her for a few days, but Misty tells her that her case got wrapped up quicker than she thought, figuring that it was time to cash in on that rain check. As Misty hands Gwen a bag, Gwen says that she didn't. She did. And once the two finish their rolled up ice cream, they get into Misty's car, and Misty says that after the last few weeks, they both learned to break, huh? Gwen sits back and lets out a sigh, stating that she managed to get the night off. Her phone is on silent. Misty then asks, where to, Dr. Stacy? Gwen says wherever the road takes them, Detective Knight. It was a sunny day in Westchester, New York, when a man takes his family to the park to play catch with his kids. As the man throws the ball and laugh, his wife says that sometimes she can't tell who of the three of them is the biggest kid. But then the sounds of an engine can be heard, and as the leaves begin to get swept away in the wind, a helicopter flies down. The man looks up at who it is and says that the answer is no, he is retired. And Electra tells him, not anymore, he isn't. There's nobody who can pull a trigger like him. There's nobody who can kill like him. And the man tells them that they swore to him that he was out. He earned happiness. And Electra hands him a duffel bag telling him that this mission is bigger than his half acre of paradise. This job requires a different kind of squadron. This target has the potential to wipe out everyone that he cares about, the power to rewrite history, and Frank, isn't this reality worth fighting for? The Punisher takes out his old suit. All right, I'm in. 
and later Electra knocks over a chess piece with her own telling him that she has found her knight. The man across on the board asks if that was a wise choice. There will only ever be one chance to pull off this assassination. Might I remind you that this is an existence level threat, and time is definitely not on our side. They've tracked the target's signature to a compound in the People's Republic of Chernia, where he teleports in and out on regular intervals. President Coulson cannot send a squadron supreme of America without sparking an international incident, and surprise is critical. Elector tells him not to worry, Defense Secretary, there are still a few moves left. And she moves another piece onto the board and the Defense Secretary says that that is a very aggressive strategy. A sort of Latvarian gamble. She asks if he has concerns that she can pull it off and the Defense Secretary says that he does have concerns about who she has assembled for her six-member squadron. So far, her team consists of Punisher, Cloak, Crossbones, and a Murder Hornet. Though Hornet, she needed a bit of behavioral modification to get her back into the game. Electra puts her chess piece down, stating checkmate, and the defense secretary says that her aggressive strategy seems to have paid off. So Electra tells him because she was willing to sacrifice any and all pieces. Later, in the People's Republic of Chernia, Electra and her team teleports in, trying to stay within the shadows. Electra spots the magic textile manipulator, Remnant keeping watch over the compound, telling Hornet that she's up, take out the sentry. Remnant begins to hear a buzzing sound and then slaps the back of his neck when he feels something sting it. He pulls his hand back to see a small hornet telling them that they just punched way above their weight class. And then a massive swarm of hornets appear and they begin to chase him around. After punching the swarm and dispersing it, he yells, ah, I have to do better than that. But no sooner than when he finishes is the cracking sound of a gunshot heard and the bullet shoots straight through Remnant's head. Frank reloads his gun telling Hornet that he appreciates the distraction and Crossbones yells, Hell man, that was a shot! Such an honor to be working with you to blow the brains out of some dirtbag. Everyone gets ready to move when Cloak stops looking at Remnant and remembers something. He could see Dagger, and she was calling out to him, and then Electra and Crossbones began to drag him away. Electra asks him if everything's okay, and Cloak tells her, yeah, he'll be fine. Meanwhile, inside, Mink, Haywire, Foxfire, Thermite, and Moonglow all watch the security cameras when Foxfire says that the Northeast camera cut out for 22 seconds. Haywire says that maybe it was a glitch. And Foxfire tells him that the security system is centuries ahead of its time. It's too advanced to glitch. Elsewhere, Crossbones begins to cut a hole into the wall and kicks it in, telling everyone that they're in. And you're welcome! Everyone rushes in with Electra telling Hornet to go ahead and hack the systems. Once they get a map of the place, they're going to teleport in and... But at that moment, Punisher asks if anyone hears that. Crossbones says that it's probably the damn Hornets. Hornet calls back stating that she heard that. And Punisher tells her, no, it sounds like. But before he could finish, dozens of drones fly out of the hallway, opening fire on everyone. More and more drones pile in, and just as they're starting to overwhelm the group, Hornet says that she's got it. The complex's power supply seems to be routed into this area. Pretty sure that this is where the command center is. Punisher snaps at her, pretty sure? And Electra says that it'll have to do. Cloak, let's go. Seconds later, Cloak appears in the control room with Foxfire stating that she will give them a chance to surrender, but they all know that they're not going to take it. Haywire shoots out his metallic tangle wire stating that there doesn't need to be any talking and he begins to strangle Crossbones, but Crossbones grabs the wire, pulling it, flinging Haywire at him. Once close, Crossbones grabs him by the head, slamming him into the ground. Mink lunges at Electra, stating that they think themselves to be good guys. The world needs to be freed of this police state. Electra blocks the claws, stating that whatever the reason, the Redeemer sided with a madman plotting to bring down their entire way of life. She knocks Mink back, swiping with her sigh, cutting Mink's throat, and then Moonglow rains hard light down, shouting that that was his friend. Cloak shields everyone, stating that she is fighting against the inevitable. His dark force absorbs all light. Moonglow begins to cry out, asking, Do you think I don't know that? Ty? Cloak pauses for a moment. Dagger? But I saw you die in our fight against the Redeemers. Dagger tells him that what he has been brainwashed to believe by the behavioral modification machine is a lie, and she is sorry that she failed him that day, instead of letting him become their puppet. She should have killed him when she had the chance. She won't make the same mistake this time. Cloak tells her no, it's still him. He just understands the importance of Squadron's cause now. 
Electra will help her see that. Don't struggle, just come with them. And Dagger yells, no, if she can't free him, she'll free everyone else. She flies up, shining her light, and Punisher says, I, I remember. Crossbones opens fire on Dagger's back. Great, with Cloak down and the Punisher forgetting that he was a killing machine, what do we do next? Punisher looks at the blood on the wall, asking, killing machine? I remember my family and that they weren't actually alive. Foxfire stands in front of Dagger, telling Crossbones that he is forgetting one thing about her, that she can stop him with one hand behind her back. As she touches his armor to power suit, it begins to crumble away as he shouts, what did you do? Foxfire says that it doesn't matter how big his guns are, when you go up against someone with the power to decay matter. Pieces begin to fall as Crossbones asks, is that so? Let's see if you can decay a bullet before it hits you. But then there's another gunshot and Crossbones is shot in the head. As Punisher puts his gun down, Elektra holds her arms up, telling him, I am your friend. We don't kill friends. And if we don't kill the target, everyone that you cared about will be erased from existence, Frank. Punisher begins to shoot at her. Everyone that I cared about is already dead. You butchered my memories. Elektra weaves through the gunfire, stating that she is sorry for this. And she stabs him in the chest. Thermite sees that and says, okay, that was pretty cold, even by my standard but we should have turned our back on. Hornet uses her power to grow to normal size, telling him, funny, she was thinking the same thing, and kicks the regulator pack that Thermite is carrying. Suddenly, Thermite explodes, taking everyone out who is close by, and as Elektra picks herself up, she hears clapping, and Kang the Conqueror steps out. That was a decent showing. Too bad your pathetic team didn't manage to do any real damage. She lunges at Kang, but he smacks her down, telling her, it doesn't take a master of time to see that this timeline needs correction. These redeemers helped provide the groundwork for my invasion forces to reset the world as it should be, with me in control, of course. As he picks a lecture up, she begins to laugh. And when he asks why she's smiling, she tells him because she is willing to sacrifice her pieces. The six of them came to lure him out. Kang asks, six, but you only had five. Just then, Cloak appears with the Winter Soldier. Both fire hitting each other in the head, and Elektra sits down, telling him, Checkmate. Later, Elektra begins to remember things about having her mind wipe, and the Defense Secretary telling her that the Gambit was quite ingenious, luring Kang into a trap with his own hubris. She says that he wiped her mind too, didn't he? And the Defense Secretary tells her, of course. She was always his favorite assassin, and great use to the cause. As Elektra begins to say Kingpin, he stops her. It's Secretary of Defense Fisk now, if you don't mind. You've managed to snare some new recruits in Foxfire and Moonglow. We might even be able to salvage Frank Castle if he survives surgery. She begins to cry. I won't remember any of this, will I? And Fisk tells her, no. The board must always be reset. But why be conflicted? You were all villains, given a gift of redemption. Whether you wanted it or not, is it really so bad being a pawn for such an important game? Years ago, a city burns and Hyperion shouts, this is madness, heroes fighting heroes. Most of Connecticut is in ruins. Over what? A superhero registration act? You're a congressman. This isn't how you tend to handle policy disagreements. Nighthawk tells him that he will not be lectured on American diplomacy by someone who's not even from the planet. Kyle Richmond may work for the federal government, but Nighthawk never will. Hyperion stops. We both know that this is more than a piece of legislation. You're the smartest and scariest man in every room. Congratulations. But it's still you that she loves, Kyle. You need to learn to live with that. Or as a friend. It will leave you bitter and broken, just like your part. But before Hyperion could finish, Nighthawk blasts him with energy, shouting, You are not a god! You're only as pompous as one! Hyperion charges in, punching the symbiote-infected Nighthawk, telling him that it doesn't take a history teacher to know that in a civil war, no one wins, both sides bleed. Let's see how the symbiote reacts when floated to the sun! Now, we go to the current time, and Hyperion and Nighthawk glare at each other, and Power Princess says that it is time for them to put aside their differences and stand together. She knows not who they are or whence they came, only that these individuals are calling themselves the Avengers. Hyperion says that he doesn't know anything about any Avengers, but he can say for Sunblasted, sure, there is something very strange going on. There is something that Bruce Banner said before he killed him. 
and sent him searching into the Arctic, where he found someone in ice, or at least there used to be someone in ice, someone that they'd forgotten. Power Princess says that it doesn't matter, and Hyperion yells, that's the thing that doesn't make sense. Maybe none of it does. Has anyone ever felt like there's something wrong with our world? Power Princess folds her arms. If only we had America's greatest detective among our ranks, and everyone looks at Nighthawk. He asks, where exactly in the Arctic was this? The Squadron Supreme begins to scour the globe looking for traces of the fabled Avengers, but over in the Night Cave, Nighthawk begins to look through some footage of Ravencroft Asylum. He pulls up an image asking Power Princess what does she see, and she tells him, well, she sees a man with a star-spangled shield. He tells her, no, not that, the other one, her. Echo was an assassin for the Kingpin. Mimicry fighting abilities, no alpha level powers. But do you recognize the energy signature that she is showing? Power Princess takes a closer look. By the bones of Gaia, that's the Phoenix. But Jean Grey is dead. I tore the wicked ginger apart myself and flew the pieces to the four quarters of the cosmos. Nighthawk tells her that they both know better than anyone that what dies doesn't always stay dead. They witness that firsthand with Hyperion and the Wolverine. Later up in space, Dr. Spectrum says that he has no idea why they're even searching here of all places. Nighthawk tells him, the energy signature that we found in the Arctic. It's the first scans that showed it to be Hyperion's, but it wasn't. It was something close. It's something that I believe that has only ever been recorded once before, many years ago, from the samples of the meteorite smuggled out of the Congo by a mercenary working for a government arms dealer, Howard Stark. The samples aren't important, it's the people that have been hiding them, who have been hiding themselves. A people who, for the first time in centuries, may have just opened their doors and given us a chance to find them. Africa, Dr. Spectrum, scan every square inch of it. Later, Dr. Spectrum stops his search in the savannah, stating, This is it. Whatever Nighthawk is hoping to find, the prism says it's right here. Hyperion looks around. There's nothing for miles, nothing that my atomic vision can see anyway. Blur runs in circles, telling him that there is something here, all right, something he can't run through, and he can run through anything. So Power Princess says that there is a great power on this land. She can feel it, and moments later, Nighthawk pulls up a night rod, stating, The Phoenix, the readings from the Arctic, the star brand from Spectrum's battle in space, the atmospheric disturbances from Zarda's encounter with the Asgardian, the trail of the Daywalker blade, it all leads here. Blur gets to work at the computer telling him, I'm hacking at super speed and yep, there's definitely a hidden network here. Just let me try a few million password combos real quick. Dr. Spectrum asks, what kind of people have hidden themselves like this for years with all of this tech? Ones he can't trust, that's who. Nighthawk tells him, people have searched this site for centuries until it was forgotten, dismissed as a legend. Welcome to the lost land of Wakanda. As the barrier begins to fade, a voice then asks, America's mightiest heroes, huh? I don't think so. Captain America steps through, leading Blade Echo, Black Panther, Thor, and the Star Brand Child, stating, We're going to be taking back our reality now. Avengers, assemble! At the end of this particular issue, there was another side story featuring Phil Coulson. In the Oval Office of President Coulson, Vice President Thunderbolt Ross, and White House Secretary J. Jonah Jameson, they ask, what are they going to do about the Avengers? They sound like a bunch of public menaces. Coulson sits at his desk, not saying a word, and the two go on calling their staff members, telling them to start gathering people together so that they can cut this off before it gets leaked to the media. On top of that, they're going to have a press release about how awful the country they're about to start bombing is, and no, it doesn't matter what country, pick one. Coulson reaches into his desk, pulling out a gun, shooting both Thunderbolt Ross and J. Jordan Jameson dead, then calls his secretary, telling them to prepare a press release on the assassinations of Ross and Jameson by sleeper agents from Wakanda. Make it appropriately stirring. As he hangs up, Mephesto slinks from the shadows in the form of a Doberman, stating, You did the right thing. The more people who say the A-word, the more the cracks begin to show in this precious little world of ours. Coulson tells him that there weren't supposed to be any Avengers. What did we miss? And Mephisto says, nothing that can't be rugged out and forgotten all over again. Coulson pauses. Do you mean to kill Captain America? And Mephisto tells him, yes. How does it make you feel, Mr. President? Jonah begins to cough and Coulson shoots him again. We should never have left him in the ice. 
I must be getting sentimental. What are the squadron, though? They're heading there now. If we lose the squadron, we lose the world. Mephisto growls. I told you it wouldn't be easy. The devil's work never is. What about getting help? Our numbers are supposed to grow. But Mephisto stomps him. Your numbers will grow, but the council won't commit. They don't trust you, and with good reason. We need to show them what we've shown this world. And what is that, my son? That Mephisto makes dreams come true. Yes. Yes, he does. There's a good little president. Coulson then says, I can't call the squadron back. Can't bomb Wakanda without drawing the world's attention. And there's only one way to handle this, sir. The same way that you remade the world in your image. I'll do it myself. With a Gila drone. With their pandemonium cube. Two years ago in Ontario, Canada, a battle took place. A battle that left the heroes in disarray as one of their shining lights, Hyperion, was killed. He died at the hands of Alpha Flight, notably the magically enhanced claws from Wolverine as they easily cut through his throat like soft butter. That was supposed to be the last stand. As the protectors of Canada, they had done a rather poor job up until that moment. The Squadron Supreme of America had led an army north of the border, annexed Alberta and British Columbia for their resources, and bombed the rest of Canada for daring to fight back. That country was left a corpse, a great white nothing, an alpha flight they were beaten and broken. But before they could be wiped off the face of the earth, Shaman used his power to teleport what was left of alpha flight. After that, the U.S. relentlessly sent squads in looking for any traces of Alpha Flight, threatening anyone who was harboring the terrorist with the death penalty. But eventually the team found themselves in Sodbury, Ontario, back with Professor Hudson. Hudson tells them that the increased frequencies of these raids are alarming. Oshawa was taken down and the Squadron Supreme is not far behind. In the last month alone, they've put more than 100 Canadian Patriots in prison for supporting Alpha Flight to their losing allies. Guardian begins to get out of her mech suit, stating that they should just free them. Shaman can port them in, and they'll scoop up the prisoners and nuke the stupid buildings. Hudson says, does she not think that Squadron Supreme is already hoping for that? It's a dog and pony show. They're using these people as bait. Sasquatch says that he's with the Guardian. They can't just leave these people, but Wolverine stops them all. We're fighting to save the country, or what's left of it. I don't like it any more than the next person, but those people knew what they were signing up for. Sasquatch transformed, shouting, Are you kidding? This has nothing to do with the war. The war is over and we lost. This is about the Squadron wanting revenge for you killing Hyperion, and you wanting revenge for them killing Jean Grey. Shaman shouts that that is enough. It's been days since any of them have had a good night's rest. They're all on edge. Aurora pulls Sasquatch close, telling him to come on. Let's get some sleep. But while everyone tries to go to bed, Sasquatch can't sleep, telling Aurora that he can't keep doing this. There's no end to the running. He promised Mac and Heather that he'd go look after Claire. They didn't want her following in their footsteps as Victor and Vindicator. She was supposed to have a normal childhood. Shaman hasn't been the same since he lost his daughter. Logan will never admit that they've already lost. They have to stop this. He can't keep carrying all those innocent people on his conscience. Aurora tells him that she won't leave. Logan's not the only one who wants the squadron dead. They killed her brother. She can't, she won't walk away. The next morning, Wolverine cracks open a beer, telling them that it's time for a team meeting, but Aurora tells him that Sasquatch is gone. Wolverine asks where, and she sips her coffee, telling him that she doesn't know. He was talking about how he couldn't do it anymore. The news of the Patriots winding up in prison really got to him. Guardian says that they need to go find him, but Wolverine takes another drink, wipes his lips, and tells them, No, this has been a long time coming. If he wants to go, then he can go. Same goes for the rest of you. If you want to leave, I'm not going to blame you. We've been running for a long time, stating that we're waiting for another shot at the Squadron Supreme, but really all we've been doing is putting other people's lives at risk because we helped them. Sasquatch couldn't live with that anymore, but to be honest, Neither can I. If the squadron wants to send their jackboots to take down our safe houses and arrest our people, hoping that one day they're going to find us, then hell, why not just give them what they're looking for? So several days later, Alpha Flight waited in a place that they knew was on the squadron's list of safe houses to be raided. And when they did, the team fought hard. But on this run, Nighthawk didn't lead the soldiers. They were sent in alone. So Wolverine sent the soldiers back with a message. 
that they are to stay off Canadian soil, seeing as they already took what they wanted. They can have Alberta and BC, and all the oil and lumber that they can handle. But what's left is theirs, and they aren't going to stop fighting for it. And the next team that comes here, they're going home in body bags. So the next day, as Wolverine and the others return, Hudson says that Sasquatch came back. Wolverine asks, I can see that. The question is why? Sasquatch tells him that he was out gathering intel, and he knows where the prisoners are being held and how to break them out. But their little stunt the other night, the prisoners are now being moved to the U.S. to stand trial. Shaman asks when they're being moved, and Sasquatch says tomorrow. They'll be held in Ottawa until then. He can't do this alone, and he knows that they don't see eye to eye, but Guardian says that they're going to stop this, right? And Wolverine tells her, of course, I'm going to work with Walt and come up with a plan. Everyone else rest up. We've got a big day ahead of us. The next day, the prison escort begins to leave Ottawa when Alpha Flight intervenes. But what they find in the van is the Squadron Supreme with Hyperion. He rockets out, backhanding Wolverine, and as Shaman gets ready to enchant his claws like before, Sasquatch grabs him before he could finish. Sasquatch squeezes on Shaman's neck until he passes out. I'm sorry. What I'm about to do is beyond forgiving. Meanwhile, across the way, Hyperion continues to beat into Wolverine, telling him, There is no sorcerer this time to save you. It's just you and me. After not moving for a bit, Hyperion grabs Wolverine by the hair and Wolverine asks, Is that all you got? Hyperion's eyes glow red. No. Hyperion puts Wolverine's head into a vice grip between his hands, blasting him with the full power of the atomic vision. It was then that Wolverine realized it was his life for theirs. Dr. Spectrum asks if he's satisfied. Has his little fantasy revenge been fulfilled? Hyperion stares. Just take him. Wolverine's charred body is lifted off the ground and sent into space. Hyperion turns his attention on everyone else, his eyes still glowing, and Nighthawk tells him, No, the deal was Logan dies, everyone else lives. As promised, the prisoners will be freed, and with Logan gone, our interests in Canada are satisfied. The four of you are now free. As the squadron leaves, Aurora turns back to Sasquatch, screaming, Traitor! Monster! Sasquatch tells them that he will not claim that he is not. He did what he had to. He sold his soul for her, for all of them. Guardian tells her to run. Sasquatch grabs it and holds it to his head, telling her to do it. Guardian trembles for a moment, smacking him with the gun, telling him no, she won't be like him. He yells, asking, what was I supposed to do? They weren't going to stop coming, and if I didn't, we'd all be executed. The squadron <laughs> promised to leave us alone. Let us live. It was the only way. Meanwhile, on an unknown moon, Wolverine crawls out, gasping for air, with Dr. Spectrum telling him that this place is devoid of life. No water, no sustenance, hell, there isn't even oxygen. He's going to take a guess that without it, that healing factor is going to be useless, or else his stay here is going to be a very, very unpleasant one. Bill Coulson never dreamed about flying or crawling on walls or riding a rainbow bridge to Asgard, but he grew up obsessed with superheroes, but never did he want to be one of them. He wanted to be the guy who even the gods had to make an appointment to see, and now he is that guy. Gods make the world better. Phil Coulson made it better. He didn't change everything, just only some things that annoyed him the most. There was no more daylight savings, no more cords getting tangled because everything is cordless now. No more restaurants that only serve Roxy Cola. But now it looks like he has to go to Wakanda himself and fix all of this. And then finally, there will be no more Avengers. Meanwhile, over in Wakanda, the Avengers are already trading blows to the Squadron Supreme. It's a fight that will change the world as we know it. Dr. Spectrum uses his prism to try and contain the Starbrand. Starbrand tells him that she doesn't want him to fight. She just wants to make him cry. She latches herself onto his neck, squeezing, telling him, this is for Rocket. But while everyone is fighting each other, Cap is in the air, chasing down the man who did all of this. As Coulson gets closer to the site, Cap jumps off his hover bike onto the president's car, ripping off the roof, telling him, I would like a word with you, sir. Coulson uses his pandemonium cube to blast Cap back, telling him, of course, Captain, and that word is goodbye. Suddenly, Hyperion and Thor crash into the ground, trading blows back and forth. But Hyperion can feel something, like Thor's face is harder than his hammer. 
His hits are getting weaker with each swing, hurting him like he's never been hurt before. Something about Wakanda is draining Hyperion's power. But in that moment, Thor lets out his rage with a thunderous lightning strike. He takes out Mjolnir, slamming it into the chest of Hyperion. Across the field, Black Panther runs alongside Blur as he punches him, telling him he's pretty fast for a cat man, but not nearly fast enough. Black Panther digs his claw into the ground to slow himself to get behind Blur, and then with a quick swipe to the legs, Blur skids to the ground. He screams in pain and Black Panther tells him, all those ligaments in his legs have just been severed. With surgery and rigorous rehab, he might be able to walk again. Begin the healing process by staying down. Blair asks him, yeah? Sure, I'll get right on that. Just because I'm a nothing without a pair of legs, right? Blur begins to spin his arm, creating a tornado, asking, I'm just a hilarious joke, right? This is my life. This is my world, Catman. Meanwhile, in the sky, Starbrand is focusing her energy into Spectrum's prism, shouting that she thought she told him to cry. As the prism begins to crumble, Dr. Spectrum curls into a ball bawling. Starbrand tells him, that's better. All right, who's next? Echo struggles with the power of Princess, telling everyone that she wouldn't say no to some help. Blade focuses attention on Nighthawk, telling him that he's just a man. Don't make this worse than it has to be. Nighthawk slices through Blade's sword, telling him that he is a vampire that hunts vampires, all before the world changed, right? Blade scoffs. Huh. Oh, so you do know the way it was supposed to be. Nighthawk kicks Blade off, leaving his Nightblade into his chest. Of course, I'm Nighthawk. Did you not figure out why the world doesn't have any more vampires for you to hunt? Take a guess. Before Blade could say anything, Nighthawk activates the taser in his blade, electrocuting him. Back in the sky, Coulson begins to climb out with Captain America asking if this is some sort of hellish cosmic cube, because that would explain a lot. He can tell the rest under oath, once we put the world back the way it should be. Coulson punches Cap with the cube. I brought order, the all-American kind, to a world that languished in chaos ever since people like you showed up, Cap. The Avengers, Earth's mightiest heroes, it had to be stopped. I made a world where the heroes are more majestic than you could ever be. And all it cost me was my soul. A small price to pay for a perfect world. At that moment, a fighter jet flies by, clipping Coulson in the head. And over the comms, a man shouts asking, Carol, what are you doing? You hit the president. And she responds with, oops, did I? Man, am I embarrassed. Sure hope he's all right and can finish killing that guy. Over with Echo, Starbrand begins to pull at Power Princess's hair as she asks, By the gods, where did you find a rabid child? Echo tells her, not sure. Just met her a little while ago. But the Starbrand and the Phoenix, well, something tells me that those two go way back. Just then, both Echo and Starbrand unleash their full power. Power Princess screams. Thor swings his hammer, telling Hyperion to stop this before he's forced to kill him. And Hyperion punches back, launching him into the air. No. Blade stands back up with Nighthawk telling him that he's beaten. But Blade tells him, I've been hearing that my whole life. A second later, he's hit with Hyperion's atomic vision. And Nighthawk tells him, you look like hell. Hyperion tells him that these people lay claim that the world has been changed. Is it true, Nighthawk? Does it matter, Hyperion? Does it make you want to fight for it any less? Hyperion looks down at the lifeless power princess. No. It doesn't. But Black Panther tells him that that is enough. They are not enough. Not here, not while the Black Panther lives. However, as Black Panther goes in to take on both Hyperion and Nighthawk, Coulson's car begins to spin out of control with Cap telling him not to do it. Coulson yells that it is a new and better world and he did it. He made the greatest earth that has ever. But before he could finish, the car crashes with Coulson still on it. Hyperion continues to fight Black Panther, telling him that he has taken lives because he knew that it was the only way to save the world. Are they saying none of it mattered? Was any of this real? Cap tells him, it was real. And I hope that you never forget it, especially this. Before Hyperion has a chance to even understand, Cap cracks him in the face with the shield, knocking him out. Echo and Starbrand begin to burn the pandemonium cube and Echo asks if she can feel it. Starbrand asks, do you mean the burning rage? 
then yes. But as the Avengers begin to get back to their feet, Nighthawk gets up stating that he wants them all to remember this. How we made this world better, safer than any of you Avengers ever could. And remember that despite everything that you did to stop us, in the end, I'm still standing. Through the burning wreckage of the flying car, Coulson crawls out shouting, No! The Pandemonium Cube! I did everything I was told! Why didn't it work? Mephisto! Why have you forsaken? And after that, everyone woke up like nothing ever changed, except Blade. He knew what had just taken place, but should he actually tell everyone? Because as far as they were concerned, their biggest problem is that Starbrand is not a baby like they remember. And she made it very clear that the next person to call her one is, by her words, going to get well. With the disappearance of Coulson and the status of the Squadron Supreme unknown, the others began to wonder if the Squadron actually knew about what Coulson had even done. Perhaps they were just pawns, or at least, it sure looked like they were. But there was one who knew what happened, and Nighthawk knows that putting the world back this way was a mistake. One that he himself will correct. Meanwhile in Hell, Mephisto says that he knows what they are thinking. His minion was entrusted with his almighty Helidrome and still failed, for which he now pays the price. But this moment is about more than that. This is about bringing them together from across the red gulfs between the hells. This was about showing them what can be done with the power of one Mephisto. Now imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, all that Mephisto could accomplish if we had 615 more. Hail, Mephisto. Hail, the Council of Red. And there you have it, Heroes Reborn. All of them, all of the omnibus kind of issues that came out of this, all the side issues and side stories and alternate universe stuff going on in general. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and don't forget to let me know in the comments down below what you overall thought of this series. And don't forget to check back every Monday for a compilation issue, a full story right here at Comic Story.